Okay, I see that we have a good number of uh, people with us already. So uh, welcome everybody to this crash course in supercomputing, uh, in which participants will learn to write parallel programs that can be run on a supercomputer. Uh, well, uh, I'm Osni Marcus. I am the chair of the CS area uh, here at Berkeley, the summer uh, program that we offer here. So the, the, this course will include concepts of parallelization and an introduction to MTI and OpenMP. These are the two leading parallel programming libraries that we have these days, and participants will have an opportunity to put together all these the concepts from the class uh, by program, compiling and running a parallel code on one of the NERSC uh, supercomputers. This class is open to participants in uh, L uh, Launch Berkeley Lab uh, CS Area Summer Program, but also to NERSC users, as well as uh, users of the Argonne Leadership Class Facility and the Oak Ridge Leadership Class Facility. These are the three computing facilities of the Department, the Department of Energy's uh, Office of Science. The course will be taught by Rebecca Hartman Baker, who leads the user engagement group at NERSC. Rebecca is responsible for engagement with the NERSC user community to increase user productivity via advocacy, support, training, and provisioning of usable computing environments. Uh, Rebecca began her career at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, then spent some time in the Pulse uh, Supercomputer cent Supercomputing Center in Australia, and then uh, she joined the NERSC in 2015. Rebecca earned a PhD in computer science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Rebecca, with that, please you take over. All right, well, thank you for the introduction, Asni, and let me get my video going here too, so you all can see me. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you're gonna have some fun in these next four and a half hours of your life, uh, learning about uh, supercomputing and how to write a code on a supercomputer. So first we need to start with some logistics slides. So let me get those out. So uh, everyone is muted when you join Zoom, but you can unmute to speak. Um, if you can, please change your name in the Zoom session to be your first name and last name. Um, and the way to do that is click on participants and click more next to your name to rename you. Um, you can click the Close captions button to toggle captions and view the full transcript. I think that is true here. Do we have that turned on? Who's the owner of this? Um... Yes, it is. Oh, perfect. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, we're going to use a, a Google Doc for Q and A. A Zoom chat's not really the best for that sort of thing. So you can see this URL. Um, it's also already been put into the chat. Maybe we can put it in again. But can you um, see last year's? Uh... Oh, this is what you sent me. Okay, I, I need to change that. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought I changed it. The link. Oh, and also the slides and video. Oh, maybe I have the wrong thing. Well, in any case. Uh, I'll put it in the Zoom chat, the link for, um, for the yeah, G-Dog. So I already we'll put, did. Yeah, sorry about that. We'll slide, put the right. The... Yeah, sorry, everybody. Uh, okay, so then if you can apply, if you haven't applied for a training account, Yet um, you can do that um, using the four letter, is that the right four letter code? Now I feel like this might be the wrong slides. Uh, no, it's the right code. Okay, good. All right. And then um, it would help us if you would answer our short survey afterwards about uh, how, it, how it went for you, how you liked it and ways that we can do better. Uh, is that it? Oh, here we go. Okay, we're gonna do some hands-on exercises on Corey. Corey is the main supercomputer at NERSC right now. Uh, and so this kind of gives you some instructions on how to do that. Okay. And, uh, and you can access these slides from our web page. Okay. So we have a reservation of the, uh, of some notes on, on Corey and they are, You've been added to the NTRAIN4 project if you if you have a, a normal use a NERSC user account. If you don't, then your training account is in the NTRAIN4 project. And so then you just, this is in the pink here, this is how you use the reservation. We'll talk about that more when we get to that part of the course. 
Okay. Sorry, Rebecca, you show the previous slides I've updated the links. Oh, okay. Thank you. I think I have to undo like oh. that and then go back to it. Go back. I see. To show it again. Yeah, this is correct now. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry, folks. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so we can go ahead and get started now, I think. If I can push the right button. Okay, here we go. Okay, so, so today we are going to uh, learn a few things. So first, we're going to uh, learn about parallelism and just the concept of what it all means and MPI. And then uh, in the second part of our course, we're gonna learn about OpenMP and hybrid programming. So in this first part, we're gonna learn parallelism, kind of concept of parallelism. We're gonna talk about supercomputer architecture. I'm not gonna go into super great detail about it, uh, but just some overview of, of it to explain kind of why we do the things the way we do. Uh, then we're gonna cover basic MPI, and it's okay if you don't understand what that means for, uh, for the moment, because you will learn. Uh, and then, then we'll do our first hands-on exercise, which is computing pi in parallel. Uh, I love pi. Um, it's like a super cool number, and it's something that we can easily compute in parallel. So that's why we're going to do that today. Uh, and then we'll learn about MPI collectives. And again, if you don't understand what that means, you will learn. Uh, and we're going to compute pi using parallel collectives instead of just using uh, the basic MPI functions. Okay, then we'll have a 30 minute break. And then after that, we will work on OpenMP and hybrid programming. So we'll learn about OpenMP and directives and things like that. Uh, and then we will use OpenMP and we will write our program to compute Pi with OpenMP. And then we'll learn about hybrid programming, which is combining MPI and OpenMP. And we will uh, compute Pi with hybrid programming, and then that will be the end. Okay, so let's talk about parallelism and MPI first. So uh, I should mention, I like to put pictures in here that are kind of tangentially related to what we're talking about uh, by searching for the, the word that I'm looking for on like Flickr or something. It makes for a little bit more of an interesting experience, I think tries to keep people awake. Uh, and then also sometimes they're funny and I really like it when people laugh at my jokes. Now it's kind of hard to do, I recognize, when we're on Zoom. But I'm hoping that I can just imagine you all laughing at my jokes or you can actually laugh at them out loud. And also if you do have any questions, uh, the, the GDoc is a pretty good place to start. But also if, if there's a question that you, know, that you think that I really need to address, uh, please go ahead and just ask me so you can raise your hand in Zoom or you can just shout it out if you need to. Okay, so getting started here. We're talking about parallelism. This is a picture from Flickr that I got from Flickr. It is called Parallel World and it's actually a blind, but it's actually quite symbolic of, of what we are going to learn about today. All righty. So first we're going to talk about sort of concepts of parallelization comparing serial versus parallel, and we're gonna talk about parallelization strategies. Okay, so the basic idea here is that when you're performing a task, it could be a scientific task, it could be a program, it could be uh, you know, doing your laundry, it doesn't matter. Some subtasks depend on one another, while others do not. So my favorite examples always have to do with food. I was, um, I grew up in Kentucky, so I'm from the, the southern U.S. And, you know, as a girl in the South, you learn that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. But I also believe that the way to a student's brain is also through their stomachs. So um, hopefully you're not too hungry right now. Hopefully it's after lunch for you. But we're going to talk about preparing dinner. So let's say that you want to make a dinner that's like a lasagna dinner for your, for your favorite people or something. So you want to make some lasagna and like some garlic bread and some salad, right? Okay, so when we're making these things, some of these things, some of the tasks that we're doing depend on one another while others don't. So we can make our salad completely independent of 
baking our lasagna, right? Those are just not even related to each other. However, when we're making our lasagna, we have to assemble it before we bake it, right? We can't bake it and then assemble it. So that's what I'm saying, where we have some subtasks that depend on each other and then others that are independent of each other. Um, so likewise, when we're solving a scientific problem, we have some tasks that are dependent on each other, but we have some that are independent of each other. And so that is the entire premise of parallelization. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so the things that we have to perform in sequence, we call those serial tasks. And the things that we can perform independently of, of one another in any order, we call those parallel tasks. So back to our lasagna dinner example. So cereal tasks. So when we're making our lasagna, right, we have to make the sauce first. We have to assemble the lasagna and then we have to bake it. And we must do it in that order. We can't do it in any other order. When we're making our salad, we have to wash our lettuce and our veggies. We have to cut them up and then we have to assemble the salad. Again, we cannot assemble it first and then cut it and then wash it, right? That would be, that would not make for a good salad. But if we look at the bigger tasks, making our lasagna and making our salad, those are independent tasks. We could make our salad first. We could make our lasagna first, right? It, it doesn't, they're not, there's no required ordering of, of those tasks. And similarly, we're gonna set the table. We could do that at any time too. We could do that before we even start cooking if we want to. Okay, so uh, maybe I am the only nerd who does this sort of thing, but when I cook something big, like I'm cooking Thanksgiving dinner, let's say, I tend to write out a whole list of tasks and when I need to start them and when I need to complete them so that I can make sure that I have my dinner on the table at the time that I want to have it on the table. So you could create a graph, okay? I mean, that's what this is. This is a, a, this is a graph with, with uh, nodes and edges, right? Uh, and it's a directed graph. Uh, of all of the things that I have to do in order to get my lasagna dinner on the table, right? So let's look at this sort of purpley red part on the, on the left here, this part over here, right? So we have to uh, do these, these things. So all of these things, making sauce, cooking noodles, and grating the cheese, those are all independent of one another. We could do those in any order in theory, right? But we have to do all of them before we can assemble our lasagna, right? Similarly, we can um, wash and wash our lettuce and vegetables. Actually, we could possibly do those together in parallel. Uh, and we got to cut all these things up, but we got to do that before we assemble our salad. Similarly, we're making a, a, a loaf of garlic bread. Uh, we're assuming we have a, a loaf of bread that we're just making it into garlic bread. So we have to uh, pre prepare our butter, garlic butter, and we have to cut our bread into slices before we can spread the butter on the slices, okay? Now, um, all of those things are what we would call synchronization points, right? This assembly here, see we have to, we, have, we can do these in any order and at any time, but they all have to be done before we can assemble, right? Same thing here with our salad or with our garlic bread. We can't spread anything until we have both of these things prepared, okay? So that's just something to keep in mind is that sometimes in your parallel algorithm, you will have things that you can do in parallel, but then all of those things have to be complete before you can do the next step. Okay, now, another thing is, I wanna do stuff in parallel here, right? This little graph at the bottom here, I've just kind of loaded up here. This shows you like how I would make my lasagna dinner in the most compact amount of time, right? So this all has to do, you know, this red purple area, that all has to do with um, making the lasagna. Uh, I assemble it here. And then this is while the lasagna is in the oven that I can work on my salad. I can take a little break, put my feet up, I guess. I can make my garlic bread. 
pan and I put my garlic bread in the oven. While that's happening, I'm setting the table. And then my dinner is out by 6 p.m. Okay, so uh, I hope that makes sense to people and you can let me know if there are any questions. So um, I'm just gonna look at this. Okay, nothing that I need to look at. I don't think you're Okay, great. Okay, so in this example, I mean, we could further speed things up, right? We could have several chefs. I don't know about you all. I have a sous chef. He's 15. Uh, and so, you know, he cooks with me. So he does one thing while I do another thing. Uh, and so that's one way that we could speed up our process, right? Is we could parallelize our process by having multiple chefs who are doing different tasks. And really, that is the whole concept behind parallel computing. Um, that's entirely what we are going to do. We're going to have multiple processors and we're going to make all of them uh, perform one parallel task. And when they when they do that, that'll speed things up because uh, they're just getting all the work done all at once. Okay, so time for a little discussion about a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, so let's say that we want to do a large jigsaw puzzle, like a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle where n is the number of pieces. And let's also pretend for the sake of argument that everyone can complete a jigsaw puzzle in a constant amount of time. Everyone completes them at the exact same speed, okay? So let's say that's t hours to complete a jigsaw puzzle. So the question is, how can we decrease the wall time to completion? So what I literally mean by wall time is if you had a clock and it's on the wall, and you look at the elapsed time. So if it takes one person T hours to complete a, a puzzle, how can we work together to complete it in less time? Alrighty, so here we go. So let's say we have a, a table and we have a puzzle laid out on it and you're doing the puzzle with me. So there's two of us, two of us. So how long is it gonna take us to complete the puzzle. So for one person, it takes T hours. How long is it gonna take the two of us to complete it? Anybody? <coughs> okay, somebody put, in, put something in the chat, maybe. T over two, okay, one half T. Ah, uh, thank you, Stefan. A bit more than T over two. Oh, 10 to the T. <laughs> A bit more than t over two. Okay, why is that? Why is it going to take longer than t over two? Anybody want to volunteer? Okay. You have to. You have to communicate with each other. Right. You have to communicate with each other. Right. And there's uh, there's resource contention. Yes, you could be working on the same pieces in different places. That's right. Have you ever? worked on a puzzle with like your annoying little sister or something and she like has her elbow on the table and it's right over like the piece that you need oh not that i've not that i know anything about that right um exactly so while it's going to be close to t over two it's there's going to be some overhead that you have to perform uh when you're doing the puzzle together that you wouldn't have to perform if you were doing the puzzle by yourself. Okay, so let's say that P is the number of people who are doing the puzzle. So we did one, we did two. You could think four would be reasonably the same. What about if we have 5,000 people? How's that gonna work for our, for our setup here? So we've got a table, we've got a puzzle on it, and we've got 5,000 people doing the puzzle. Does that sound like a good idea to anyone? I feel okay. like a lot of people would just be waiting your turn to do something. That is right. I see, and I see somebody says uh, a few people will will do the puzzle. Some of them will just watch. They'll just have to watch. There's not enough space. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Communication cost goes way up. That's true. That's true. Communication could take longer. Sure. Yeah. So, okay, so we think that putting people at the table together, you know, we could fit maybe at an average table, we could fit four 
to eight people, but probably not 5,000. And furthermore, we're saying we're doing like a 10,000 piece puzzle. So we have 5,000 people. Each person would get to put in two pieces. Probably not a very efficient use of the time of all of those people. Okay, so let's go on to another idea that I have. Okay, so here's another setup. This is the COVID friendly setup, okay? So we have P people. Each of them are at a separate table and they each have N divided by P pieces each. And let's say for the sake of argument that the pieces are kind of pre-divided into just the area where they, you know, just one area. So you don't have like one piece from the upper left and not a piece from the lower right hand part. You just have pieces from an area. Okay. So what is the uh, what is the impact of this this COVID friendly setup uh, on your wall time to completion uh, and your communication and resource contention? Are you, any ideas? Anybody have any comments on this, or is this yeah, or is this can a you ask that question again? Well, okay. So I've got I've got these separate tables. You have each of us has like an area of the puzzle that we are doing. So. How, how is this going to impact our wall time? That's, that's the big question. No need to communicate while you're working on your own area. That's true. You don't have to communicate for your own area. Okay. But what if you did need to communicate? Yeah, because you're not, you don't, you won't necessarily have the answer to that, that, you know, you won't have that puzzle piece you need. It might be in someone else's area. Right, right. Especially if like, you know, you're almost done. You're doing like the edges of your part, right? Then the the that that's adjacent to someone else's part, right? So if we do need to communicate in in this scenario, where by communicate I mean like give someone another piece, uh, you have to stand up, right? Pick up that piece, walk all the way over to their table, and give it to them, right? So communication in this in this uh, scheme is is like really really expensive. Right. Okay. And then resource contention. We're going to, you know, I, I'm going to have a piece that you're going to want because it's right at the edge of, of the area that you're working on. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Intra table versus inter table communication. Exactly right, Benjamin. Okay. The merging time says Amateur. Yes. Overhead is merging time. That's right. Because at the end, I mean, I put it, I put together my block, you put together your block, we have to merge them. We have to join them together somehow. That's right. You need to communicate when combining your chunks with others. Correct, Julian, good. Um, shorter time to make the small areas than some time to stick them together. Yeah, Hannah, okay, that's good, yes. Hard to combine, yeah. I see a lot of people saying hard to combine the results, merging the sub puzzles. Yes, that would take some time. Okay, and then Monica says, yes, different people may finish at different times and other people would need to wait. Yes, okay, that is something that we haven't really talked about yet is load balance. Uh, in this case, I'm trying to assume that we all have an equal number of pieces, give or take, and that we all complete puzzles at the same rate. But you are kind of reading my mind, Monica, because here's an alternate setup. We can divide up our puzzle by the features of it. So let's say it's you know one of those beautiful landscape pictures, right? Like that, like they always have on puzzles. So there's different features of of the puzzle. So some parts of it have a mountain. Another part is is the sky. Another part is the stream, the tree, the meadow. You know whatever. Okay, let's say we give each of those features to one person. So what is the impact on our wall time? Uh, our communication and our resource contention. So Monica kind of had it here, and she was like, well, there could be uh, some people who have a bigger part, right? Like maybe the so mountain is really huge. Yeah, go so ahead. It's, a, it, it's an unequal workload. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's right. We could have an unequal workload with this, with this scenario. Um, I could have a lot more work than you or whatever. Um, let's see what other folks are saying in the chat. Depends on complexity of each feature, yeah. 
pieces might be different sizes. Yep, yep, these are all good points. Um, so another another challenge I think would be, you know, you you do these puzzles. There's no discrete, uh, you know, like you have the mountain in the sky. Like it's pretty obvious which piece, which part, you know, which color or whatever goes to the mountain versus the sky. But you have pieces that have some mountain and some sky, right? So where do you assign those? Like who do you give those to? That could be tricky too. Yes, specialization of workers performing the work case. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth, good. Harder to fit the pieces together. Where do trees go in relation to the mountain? Yes, good, Hannah. Um, requires synchronization. Yes, Amador, that is right. It requires synchronization, that's true. Okay, so now you all probably think, okay, this lady is pretty strange. Why is she talking to us about jigsaw puzzles? Um, what does this have to do with computers, right? Well, I will tell you in a minute what it has to do with computers. Okay. Okay, so Dylan has a great, a great question. If you divide the image into the stream, sky, and other components, wouldn't table-to-table -table communication be less necessary during assembly since most tasks focus on directly one portion of the puzzle. Yes, that is entirely possible, Dylan. It kind of, it, I mean, I guess the answer is it kind of depends on what really you're doing. Um, but it's possible that that, that 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 could be true. Okay, and then Ken mentions that you would need to invest time to sort the pieces as well. Ken, you are correct. That is something that I was neglecting just for the sake of, argument, but yes, in real life, you would definitely need to sort the pieces as well. Although I don't know if y'all have ever done children's puzzles, but sometimes um, in children's puzzles, they uh, they kind of number it on the back <laughs> to make it easier for, for you to, to do the puzzle. So maybe, maybe this is a giant 10,000 piece children's puzzle. I don't know. Okay. Um, so next, we're going to talk about parallel algorithm design. So there's a really handy acronym called PCAM, and this is how we this is how we make uh, uh, design parallel algorithms. This is the procedure. So the first thing that we do is we partition our problem. So we decompose our problem into the smallest possible tasks that we can think of to maximize the potential for parallelism. So we're not thinking about whether it's practical to divide it up into these fine grained tasks. We're just dividing it up in the smallest possible pieces that we can. All right, so then our next step is communication. So we, we wanna determine the communication pattern among those tasks. So similar to that graph that I showed you about uh, when we we're cooking our lasagna dinner. Okay, so again, we're not uh, we're not making judgments. We are just determining what the communication pattern would be uh, if we were going to divide it up like this. Okay, our next step is called agglomeration. So this is where we start thinking a little bit more practically. So we combine these uh, fine grained tasks into coarser grade tasks if necessary in order to sort of reduce the communication requirements or other costs. So like those dependencies. Uh, so, for example, if we're if we're making our dinner, it's probably it's probably best if 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 the same person does everything for the for the prerequisites for assembling the lasagna. That might be the best way to do it, um, in order to reduce the the requirements, the communication requirements, or the uh, you know just the ordering requirements of of the algorithm. Uh, and then the final thing is mapping. And mapping is assigning tasks to processors uh, subject to a tra the trade-off between the communication costs and concurrency. So um, some things uh, are, are costly communications, um, but sometimes it might be a good trade-off to let that communication need to happen uh, in order to in order to expose more parallelism in other ways, 
Okay. So anyway, if you just remember PCAM, partition communication agglomeration mapping, you can uh, design your own parallel algorithm. And we'll talk more about this. So don't, don't think that you must memorize this right this moment. Although it will be on the exam. Ha ha ha. Just joking, no exams. Okay. So next we're gonna talk about computer architectures and you're gonna see that I wasn't such an insane person for talking to you about puzzles <laughs> and the way that I had those setups for uh, solving our puzzles. So, but before we get there, does anybody have any questions? Or I've just explained everything so well that uh, you don't have any questions. I'll give you a second here in case people are typing. There are a couple already that's uh, getting answered in the Q&A doc. Oh, excellent, excellent. And I appreciate people who are answering them. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna talk about architecture next. Okay, so we're gonna talk about supercomputer architecture. So we're gonna talk about what is a supercomputer and we're gonna have a conceptual overview of architectures. So I've put in some pictures here of some of my favorite supercomputers. And then I've got a picture here of, of uh, the architecture of our Perlmutter machine that is coming in at NERSC right now. So this one was my all time favorite. It's the Cray one, it's from 1976. It kind of looks like a couch in some ways, you know, especially like a couch from the 1970s because it is, because what they said was you could put this thing out in the lobby of your headquarters, right? Of your business and people could sit on it while they're waiting for an appointment with the CEO. So this part that goes, that's under the fake leather here, or maybe it was real leather, I don't know. It looks kind of shiny though. This part that's under the leather is the cooling system for the machine. And then on the inside here, it's the processors. And, and they're in this semicircular shape uh, so that that would minimize the distance between them for the sake of the communication um, between, between the different nodes. So the, so the seats would be heated because that's the cooling system? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> heated, heated seats, seats right away. Yeah, pretty luxurious <laughs> in 1976. <laughs> All right, so the next machine I have on here is the IBM Blue Jean. Uh, and that machine was pretty revolutionary. Um, I know in this picture, it looks kind of stilted. It kind of looks like that's a weird angle or you know a wide angle lens or something, but actually, those um, those machines they they actually were parallelogram shaped, so and that had to do with the cooling. So like the the sort of the half the, the triangular part that comes off there that was that was like the cooling system, and then it would come out in another triangular shaped part that was on the other side. And uh, this was kind of the first machine that had like a whole bunch of really low power processors in it. Um, because they they figured out and you know you can massively parallelize a lot of problems and so you just can have all these little processors just doing all these little things and it all adds up to this big thing uh, so that was a pretty amazing machine uh this next one here this one shows my age uh this is jaguar it was my first supercomputer um so when i worked at olcf uh i was one of the team that helped to bring in uh Jaguar, which was a petaflop machine in 2009. And now here we are, and Oak Ridge just brought in uh, an exaflop machine. So very impressive, uh, a lot of progress that happens uh, just in a matter of a decade or a bit more. Pretty amazing. And it's okay. still not enough. <laughs> it's still not enough, that's right. <laughs> so you can see here, this is a breakdown of the HPE Cray Shasta architecture. Uh, and this architecture is what goes into Perlmutter that we have and also into uh, Frontier at OLCF. Um, so basically it breaks down, I mean, okay. So we've got the cooling, which is very interesting, but not relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, and we've got uh, compute blades. So each of these compute blades actually contains four nodes. And then um, there's a whole bunch of them and they go into a chassis. And then each of these chassis, there's a whole bunch of them and they go into a rack of the machine. Anyway, 
I think it's pretty amazing. You get all these millions of parts and you put them together and you come up with these amazing supercomputers. Okay, so what is an actually supercomputer? I've been saying all these supercomputers, but uh, a supercomputer as defined by Henry Neiman is the biggest, fastest computer right this minute. Uh, so Henry uh, is a supercomputing educator and he's actually my academic brother. We both have the same advisor. Um, but a, a better, I shouldn't say a better, but a, a, a looser, but more working um, definition is that a supercomputer is at least a hundred times more powerful than the PC of the day. So I think William mentioned in, in the chat there that you know your iPhone is much more powerful than that Cray one that I showed you before. Uh, but at the time it was a supercomputer. I mean, it was way more powerful than anything else that was around at that time. It's just that computers keep growing. Um, and so this field of study, you may hear it called supercomputing, high performance computing, HPC for short, or scientific computing. Um, and those are all kind of different aspects of the same field of study. Basically what it kind of boils down to is that we have scientists and they're using these really big, enormous computers to solve these really hard problems that really can't be solved any other way. So there's kind of two different types of architectures of supercomputers. The first one we call SMP architectures. So that means symmetric multiprocessor. Uh, and basically the idea of it is that we have a massive memory that is shared by processors. So all the processors can access the memory um, everywhere in the memory. Uh, and so that means that a processor can work on any task, no matter where it is located in the memory. And this type of architecture is really great if you're parallelizing something like a sum or a loop or something like that. Really great architecture. Uh, you may also notice that it's very similar to if you had a table with a puzzle on it and you had multiple people around the table where the, the table, it, it represents the memory, the people represent the processors and the puzzle represents the work that you're doing, okay? So, oh yeah, oh, Rebecca, she ain't so crazy after all. Okay, next we have what we would call a cluster architecture. So in this case, what we have is we have CPU nodes or, or it could be GPUs, but we're, we're just sticking with CPUs for now. We have them in these racks and they, they can do computations really fast. And they communicate through these network connections that is very slow relative to the speed of the CPU. Um, and so this is kind of like, what I was talking about our COVID friendly setup where everyone has their own table and they do all of their processing of the work, the puzzle on their table. And then when you have to communicate, it's a great big effort. And when you uh, put together your whole puzzle back together, instead of just your sub puzzle, that is a lot of work, uh, a lot of communication required in order to make that happen. So when we have an architecture like this, that's a cluster architecture, we want to be sure that we write our programs so that they divide our computations evenly, but minimize the communication between the nodes. Okay. Now today we have architectures that are hybrid because, you know, want to get the best of both worlds. So we have multiple core nodes, could be up to 128 core nodes, um, and they're connected to other nodes by slow interconnects. And when I say slow, I mean, they're very fast. It's just that they're much slower than, than the processor speed, right? That's all. So within a node, all the processor cores are going to share memory, kind of like a small SMP machine. So a node is like an SMP machine. <clears throat> But then if you look kind of from a bigger scale, the, the machine is a cluster architecture because it has, it just has these nodes that are individual and have their own memories and, and communicate, you know, through the interconnect. Um, it's just that each of the nodes happens to be a multi-core node rather than a single processor. Um, and so if we want to 
program for something like this, um, we need to use uh, we need to use programming um, constructs that that will work both in a cluster architecture and in an SMP architecture. So that's MPI for the cluster and OpenMP for the SMP architecture, for the hybrid programming. So this is exactly why I'm going to teach you everything that I'm teaching you today. OK, now, there's another architecture that is uh, in all of the exascale type of machines, and it's in Perlmutter, our new machine as well. And it's a hybrid CPU and GP GPU architecture. So the, these nodes consist of uh, one or more multi-core CPUs and one or more GPUs, um, we, uh, where you um, offload really heavy computations to GPUs. GPUs are really good at crunching numbers and absolutely nothing else that they're good at. They're just really like the ultimate sort of uh, low power processors with massive parallelism within the GPU. Um, there's, there's suddenly there's a separate memory for the CPU and the GPU on the same node. Um, and it's a pretty complex programming paradigm and we're just not gonna talk about it really today, uh, but people will often use CUDA to directly program a GPU, especially well, an NVIDIA GPU. Um, then there's other standards that people might use, uh, such as OpenACC or OpenMP. And we are gonna learn about OpenMP, but we're not gonna learn about this aspect of OpenMP. Um, and then there's also programming environments like Cocos or Raja that just kind of take care of everything for you under the seams and you don't have to pay any attention to what's actually going on. Okay, so sorry, we just can't cover that today. There's just uh, too much that we are covering today to be able to include anything about GPUs, I'm afraid. Okay, so that is my really fast, rapid overview of the uh, architectures. Uh, are there any questions before we go on to MPI? Okay, I'm gonna say no questions. Great. If you have questions, questions are being answered um, in Q and A by a, a couple of active users here as well. William Pham and Andrew, uh, Willow. Michael Lowitz, thank you. And thank you all. Yes. Some uh, rest of them, some logistic questions as well. Okay, thanks, Helen. Helen is also doing a terrific job here. I hope that you all attended her class last week. Um, well, the students, summer students, I guess. Um, I made a mistake in the logistics slides. I made it the, to the last years. <laughs> oh, that's to the length. So yeah. Okay, but Helen is really good at explaining things and. It actually knows more about OpenMP than I do by a long shot. So, so I'm glad that she's here to correct all my mistakes too. Okay, so we're going to talk about MPI. Turns out MPI is also the name of this ship, which is uh, the MPI Adventure. It is actually an offshore, uh, offshore windmill building ship. Who knew that was a thing, but there you go. Okay, so we're gonna do kind of an introduction to MPI. Oh, okay, Alfred. Our code's written in MPitch, Open MPI and others able to run without modification. Um, okay, so first of all, as we are gonna learn here, MPitch and Open MPI are, um, are just implementations of the same MPI library, okay? Uh, and so hopefully if you, so whatever you write as a user of the MPI library, it will work in either or any uh, MPI implementation, okay? Uh, there are some fundamental differences between the ways that they are actually implemented, but they should work, uh, but your code that's written on top of both of those libraries would work fine. Okay, that's a good question though. Okay, so we're gonna have an introduction to MPI. We're gonna be kind of reminded about some parallel programming concepts. We're gonna learn the six necessary MPI commands to write any MPI program poorly, possibly poorly. 
possibly inefficiently, but you can just you can write just about anything that you want to do using these six MPI commands. And then I'm going to show you an example. Okay, so MPI stands for message passing interface. And it is an industry standard. That's what it is. It is a document. So if somebody says to you, what is MPI? You could say it is the industry standard for parallel programming. That's all it is. Now there are MPI implementations, okay? And those are implemented by vendors and also open source implementations. So for example, Cray, I guess it's now HPE, but Cray, HPE, they have their own implementation of it. IBM has their implementation. Uh, and then most of those implementations though are based upon either MPitch or OpenMPI, typically MPitch, which is an open source version. And I think um, those are, uh, so So the Cray version is based on MPitch. And then um, I wanna say that the Intel version is based on OpenMPI, but I could be wrong. Okay, so, but the point is you use the MPI function library in your C, C++ or Fortran program to write a code. Now, there are other uh, interfaces into MPI. For example, Python has a uh, um, PyPy. Is that right? Uh, no, MPI for Py. Sorry, I was getting myself confused. It has a MPI for Py, which you can use also to write uh, parallel programs. But um, in this course, we're just going to really talk about C, C++, and Fortran. So there are different standards. Uh, in fact, the current standard is MPI-4. It was released almost exactly a year ago. Um, but really most of the stuff and all the stuff that we're gonna learn today is in uh, MPI-1 and MPI-2 standards. Um, uh, MPI-3 was developed in 2012. It was a mere 800 pages of reading, if you wanted to read that. And it had a lot of major revisions like non-blocking collectives and extensions to one-sided operations. Um, but those are those are advanced, so we're not going to learn about those today. Uh, and then MPI-4 had some more uh, revisions that I think in, included some stuff with fault tolerance and stuff. But we're not, and again, we're not going to worry about MPI-3 or MPI-4. Those are too advanced. We're just going to learn stuff that's in MPI-1 and MPI-2 and is still in MPI-3 and MPI-4. Okay, so, so now when we write a parallel program, there's kind of two different sort of paradigms for our program that we can use. So one is called SPMD and one is called MPMD. SPMD stands for single program multiple data. And that is what the majority of, uh, of codes are written as today. Um, and then there's MPMD, which is multiple programs, multiple data. And you see that occasionally, but not as often. But you can use MPI for either one. So SPMD, the, the example of this would be, you write a single program that will perform the same operation on multiple sets of data. So if we're talking about cooking, <laughs> then we have multiple chefs baking many lasagnas. Or let's say that we're rendering a movie. We might render different frames of the movie. That would be an SPMD operation. MPMD is where you write different programs to perform different operations on multiple sets of data. So if we have multiple chefs preparing a four course dinner and they're all preparing different parts of it, that would be an MPMD program. Uh, if we were rendering different parts of a movie frame, like let's say we were, um, uh, let's see, what, what movies do the cool kids watch today? Uh, Top Gun. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, let's <laughs> let's go with that. If you're rendering different parts of Top Gun, I'm sure there was lots of CGI in that, right? Um, one part you have, I don't know, Tom Cruise doing Tom Cruise things. Another part of it you have somebody else. I'm sorry, I didn't see that movie. <laughs> we better come up with a movie that I've actually seen. Um, let's see. What does my daughter love? Um, oh, Encanto. She loves Encanto. You've seen that one. Um, so in one part where you have Isabella, who is her favorite character, uh, and then you have 
you have one process that renders Isabella and you have another process that renders the grandma, then um, you know, that would be an example of an MPMD um, program. Okay, and then we can also even write a hybrid program because hi everything's hybrid. Have you noticed that already? This is a pattern. Uh, you could write a hybrid program in which you have some processes that are doing one task and some processes that are doing another, right? So pretty much you can do whatever you like. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the six necessary MPI commands. Okay, so if you uh, if you learn these commands, like I said before, you can write just about any program that you want, uh, a parallel program. Um, it may not be efficient. It may not uh, work quite right, but um, pretty much anything that you want to do, you can you can do it with this. Okay, so we'll learn about these as we go along, but. We've got MPI init, MPI finalize, MPI com size, MPI com rank, MPI send, and MPI receive. Okay, so let's get started on these. So first thing is MPI init. What this does is it initiates MPI, so it starts it up. So you place this in the body of your code. Um, so typically when I write a code, I'll place it right after the variable declarations and before any MPI commands, if you have any MPI commands before MPI init, uh, their behavior is undefined. So you don't want to find out what happens. Um, it pairs with MPI finalize, which shuts down, right? So we've got initiate, we've got shuts down MPI. You place this at the end of the code after your last MPI command. Um, so if you're writing in C or C++, you do MPI final in your main, you know, in your main, you do MPI finalize, return zero, and then that's it. It's the end of your code. Okay. Um, so the next two we call environmental inquiry. So MPI com size and MPI com rank. So you use MPI com size to find out the number of processes that are that are running your parallel code. This allows you to have the flexibility to, to use the same program and use different numbers of parallel processes while running the same program, okay? And, oh, what happens if you forget to finalize? Probably nothing. Uh, probably nothing will happen if you forget to finalize but uh, you still probably want to do it. Um, so, uh, so I should take that back. So, um, so typically when you're running on a supercomputer, what happens is you're allocated some nodes and you run your thing and then you get kicked off and it prepares for the next user. So it'll do stuff like clear out all the buffers, it might even reboot the nodes depending on what's happening. Um, so if you don't MPI finalize and you quit right then, then, um, it'll just clean up after you and everything will be fine. If you don't MPI finalize and then you run something else on there, uh, there could be problems. I don't know what problems exactly. Um, I've never tried it personally, but it does happen all the time, actually, that somebody doesn't MPI finalize. Like if their program fails or if a node fails or something, then there's no way to finalize. Um, but the but the supercomputer, the, actually, it's I guess it's Slurm, it's the scheduler. It will go in and it'll clean everything up before it hands the node to the next user. So you can probably get away with it, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't try it. Okay. Um, all right, so MPI com size tells us the number of processes that are available for us to use while we're running the program at the time of running, at runtime. Okay, and then MPI com rank tells you the identifier of the current process. Okay, so I know this all sounds a little bit surreal, probably if you've if you've never really thought about things this way, 
but it's kind of like it's kind of like um you know have you ever been in class or something and you all have to number off and like all the number ones go to one place and all the number twos go to another place okay uh so the uh so then you're in your group and you might want to number again so let's say you have turns out you have five people in your group okay that's your mpi com size okay uh that's how many how many processors that are there to do the activity whatever this thing is that we're all going to be doing okay and then the rank is if you were going to number within your group to do different subtasks that your little group is going to do, uh, that would be the rank. Uh, now, it actually starts counting at zero. Okay, so so the first person is rank zero, and then the second one is rank one, up to size minus one. So in our case, we've got five people. We go zero through five. I'm sorry, zero through four. Uh, so less than five. Okay, um, so when you're designing these algorithms, you kind of have to think like in terms of, let's say that I am a certain individual rank within this larger group of processes. Um, and so that's, that's what, how this can come in handy is to know which rank you are. You might have different ranks perform different tasks. Um, for example, there's a very common algorithm that's a manager worker algorithm. And so you, you would have rank zero be the manager and then uh, the remaining ranks would be the workers. So that's just one example of why you might wanna actually know the rank. All right, so it wouldn't be called message passing interface if we didn't pass any messages, now would it? So we have two, uh, we have, two message passing uh, commands that we are gonna learn in this first part here. So there's MPI send, so that's sending a message. So um, we'll go over what all of these things are a little bit more later, but basically you wanna store whatever it is that you're sending in this buffer. And then this count here tells you how big it is, meaning how many whatever's like ints, or floats or, or whatever it is that you're passing, how many of them are there? And then this tells MPI what the data type is of that, of that uh, thing that's stored in this buffer. Uh, this destination here, that's where you're sending it to. So which rank do you wanna send it to? Uh, this tag business here, that is to give it a special tag if you need, if you need to have special identifiers for different types of messages or something. Uh, and then there is the communicator, which is, um, so here's an example. Uh, in this case, we're gonna send something that's stored in this location called X. The, this is, this ampersand means uh, the, the address of X. One, meaning it's just of length one. There's only one thing that we're sending. It is a double. I'm sending it to the manager. And then I just had, I just arbitrarily decided my rank, that's going to be the tag. And then this MPI com world, this is the set of all processes that, uh, that, that are in, that are currently executing this code. So it's kind of our world, if you will, our communication world it is all the nodes that we know about that we are authorized to use, okay? I know that, that sounds a little weird, but hopefully uh, we can wrap our heads around that one too, as we keep going. All right, oops, sorry. Oh, and I love how people are answering each other's questions. It's great. Okay, so the next thing is, receive, right? So we sent something, now we need to receive it, right? So the receive is sort of the same format as the send. So we're gonna receive into this buffer. We're gonna receive count number of things. And this is the data type of the things that we're receiving. This is who we're receiving it from, the source. The tag is again, that special tag. The communicator, 
which we have discussed, and then status. And what this is, is, uh, you know, were we successful or not? Okay, so here's an example. So this is receiving uh, from, you know, receiving like the equivalent of, of this, the sum. Now we're going to receive it. Uh, we're going to receive it into our own buffer called X of length one. And we know it's a double. And it's coming from some source somewhere. And that source used its same identity, its rank as the tag. And we are within this MPI com world. This is kind of our global world, like I said. And then this records the status, the success or failure, but hopefully just success of our receiving. Okay. So here's a warning for you all. Both of our standard send and receive functions are blocking. So MPI receive returns only after the receive buffer actually contains the message that it's requesting. So that means you invoke MPI receive, it just sits there like this and it just waits to receive the message. And then MPI send may or may not block until the message that it has sent is into the hands of the receiver, but generally it does block. So this is a place where we need to watch out for deadlock. So I know when I was first getting started, I ran into so many, so many uh, MPI send and MPI receive deadlock problems. That's why I wrote this in here. Okay. Um, so here is an example program. And if you were to run this program, it would deadlock, it always deadlocks, okay? This program, purpose of this program is to illustrate deadlock. But what it does is it takes pairs of processes and it has them send and receive a message, okay? So let's say like from my point of view, I am process, um, I am process two just for, for kicks here. Um, and so I'm gonna uh, receive from my neighbor uh, their rank, and then their, and then I'm gonna send to my neighbor my rank. That's how it's gonna work. So let's run through this from a point of view of processor rank two. Okay, so let's say we come down here. So, so you've probably never seen one of these programs. So here I'm, I'm defining all my variables, right? Just like I said. Then I invoke MPI in it, and I put MPI finalize and return at the end, okay? So I invoked MPI in it. Then I found out what is the size of this communicator that I'm in? Um, oh, let's say it's four just for fun, okay? Um, it has to be a, a, an even number because I get a return zero otherwise. Okay, and then let's say my rank is two. Just again, we're just, we're having fun here. So if, uh, okay, so this line was just designed so that if there's somebody who's left out an odd number uh, of nodes, then, or I'm sorry, an odd number of ranks, then we just quit the program because this program is made for an even number of ranks only. Okay, so let's say if I am an odd number rank, well, I'm two, so I'm not. Then if I were though, the, the one I'm gonna send to is my rank minus one. But since I'm an even number, the one I'm gonna send to is my rank plus one. So I'm two, so I'm gonna send to number three, rank number three. Okay, cool. So that's who I'm going to be hanging out with. I'm going to be sending them something. They're going to be sending me something, right? So first thing I do is I wait to receive. So I'm like, okay, bring it. Give me your number that you're going to send to me. Number uh, Rank number three, here I am. I'm waiting for you. Send it to me, right? And I'm going to sit there forever. I'm going to sit there forever because um both me and rank number three are both going to try to receive first before we ever send anything and because of that receive always blocks always blocks so we're just going to sit here forever waiting until either um the end of time um the machine fails 
or our job wall time runs out. Okay. That's going to block forever until it gets canceled somehow. All right. Uh, so here's my sometimes deadlocking example. So I am just. What will be replaced in the source argument of MPI C? Let me see. The source argument is this one. So basically, maybe send to isn't the best name for the variable, but the idea is this is this the send to thing here, either here or here. That is who I'm going to be working with in this exercise. Right, so if I'm processor two, then I'm working with processor three. And if I'm processor three, then I'm working with processor two. Okay, so now in, in this example, all I did was I swapped it. So first we send and then we receive. This may work, this may work because sometimes send isn't blocking. Uh, a lot of times with a really small message like this, this is just a, a one integer length message very small, um, it won't block because it's not too worried about, if it had to resend that, it's really no big deal, right? It's a very short message. Uh, but a lot of times for big messages, it it blocks. I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, probably the the, the uh, letter carrier, they will, they will just leave you a letter, right? But if it's like a giant package, a lot of times they, they want to ring your doorbell and make sure that you're there and that you get it before they leave it there. Similar idea here, you know, valuable cargo, it takes a lot of effort to send a really big message. So um, it may block. So this, this, uh, this example could be blocking. All right, so then how do I solve this problem? Well, this is how I solve the problem. So what I do is I have changed it. I've changed the ordering of the sends and receives, depending on uh, whether I'm an even or an odd rank, okay? So if I'm rank two, okay, I'm gonna hang out with rank three, according to this. And now if I, I am an even number, so um, I'm gonna send a message and then I'm gonna receive from my partner, okay? And, if, and then my partner, who is an odd number, they are going to receive from me and then send to me afterwards, okay? Um, and then we're gonna be able to print this line finally and MPI finalize and return, okay? So are there any questions about these uh, dead lacking? Okay, is there a better criterion than sometimes? No. When, Sending blocks. So, um, so basically, the the reason, um, the reason that I said uh, sometimes, is because in the standard it does not specify that send must be blocking. Um, so some implementations do it differently than others. So that's the reason I said that MPI send sometimes blocks. Um, but when you write your program. You have to kind of, yes, it is implementation dependent. Yep. So when you write your program, you have to understand that it could be blocking. And so in order to make a program that will work across platforms, you, you need to take that into account and into consideration uh, when you design your algorithms and, and design your, your communication patterns. So can it cause loss of data if it's not blocking, if it's sending, but it's not received, can it cause loss of data? Um, so if it is sending and not received, it kind of depends on, on why it's not received, I suppose. Um, so if it's not received simply because there's no matching receive, uh, then yeah, I mean, definitely you've lost your data. Uh, if it's not received because there's some kind of an error, usually the machine will detect that and it will resend. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So now, do I lose any efficiency in doing this in the sense that simultaneous sending can be parallel? Um, so if, 
if you're particularly concerned about um, sitting around and waiting for messages, there are more advanced sends and receives that that you can that you can use. Um, so uh, so there's the, there's one called MPI I send and MPI I receive, and those are non-blocking sends and receives. And um, it's not something that we're going to talk about really much today, uh, but you you should just know that those exist, and you would be able to use those uh, in order to really optimize your sends and receives. Um, there's also one-sided operations. Those are in MPI3, one-sided uh, sends and receives. And um, well, I guess it's just one-sided send. It's not really a receive. Uh, and so you can use those. Um, but again, those are outside of the, uh, the scope of this course because we're really just beginners in this course. Okay, and then Vincent, what does MPI status do? Okay. MPI status is a struct, and it uh, stores the status of, of how an operation, uh, of the success or failure of an operation. So like in this case with MPI receive, this status, once this, run, once this goes through, then status would say success, okay? It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea of it. Um, and then, um, so you, so when you use more advanced operations, then you can use that status to sort of test for how, you know, has this, has this receive completed or not, right? Because obviously in the case of receive, which is a blocking, uh, blocking function, um, you know, you can't get past it to find out what the status was, right? Until it happens. But for a more advanced, uh, like MPI, I receive, then um, you could you could use it for for testing the progress. Okay, great questions. So Rebecca, there's a question yeah. in Q and A hasn't been answered uh, oh. from Bob Berg. What happens okay. if I try to be clever at the static level in C plus plus? Things happen before the first line of main. Just avoid anything parallel at that level. Can I talk it into running MPI init before any static initialization? Mm, that's a good question. Um, eh, eh, so it's you know it's really best to really not do very much before MPI init. You could probably get away with doing some static variables and you know setting their values beforehand. Um, most MPIs will behave in a reasonable way um, because I think essentially what the, what MPI does is so so when your code gets launched, it launches n copies of your code all running independently until MPI init. Then when MPI init happens, then it uh, it does some coordination. It figures out, you know, which processes are in the communicator, how to how to rank, you know, how to give them a number, rank them, um, and how how to communicate through through and coordinate with each other. So probably anything that doesn't involve any kind of uh, differences of of, of rank. Uh, is probably you can probably get away with it before your M MPI init, but it's just good practice to try to avoid that as much as possible. I mean, I've seen people who have like lines and lines of code before MPI init, and you really don't want to do that. But setting variables is probably fine. You know, setting values of static variables is probably okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, in the else statement here, will the blocking receive only trigger upon some other process sending to you? Uh, yes, Kevin, that is right. In the else statement here, this receive here, it'll finally complete. It's depending upon this send happening from someone else. Okay, would you mind explaining the arguments for the first MPI receive line again? Thank you. Okay. 
Yushuan for this MPI receipt. So, oh, this here's receipt that was sent. <laughs> so this is the piece of memory where I'm gonna write whatever I'm receiving into, okay? Now, in this case, because we just have a scalar integer, I've got to use this ampersand to expose what is the memory address. So this is like direction. This is like, it's like, uh, you know, when, you, when you're receiving a package from UPS or you're something and you're like, you know, put the package on the left side of the door behind the giant potted plant, right? That's kind of the instructions here, effectively. This is saying how how big uh, the um, the number of items that I'm going to receive, how many of them I'm going to receive. Um, so this number is actually a maximum. So I could put you know a thousand here or something if I wanted to, and still only receive one. That would be okay. But if I put one here and I receive two, that's that won't work. Okay. Um, MPI in int here. This says. This is the data type and they're all just MPI underscore and then the name of the data type. So in this case, I know I'm gonna receive an integer, an int. Okay, this is who sent it to me. This is, this is where it came from. This is a special tag, okay? Uh, and you usually you wanna put a special tag on it. Um, sometimes you can do that to uh, for different types of messages so that you can understand why why this message is coming and, and how to process it correctly. Um, but it's not it's not too important in these kind of very simple um, applications. Now this MPI com world, this is um, this is actually a, a macro from uh, from MPI uh, and it, it's a so it's a variable from MPI and and it it represents, um, all of the processes that are in uh, the same execution of my code at this at this point in time, okay? And then the status is, again, so because we've got this ampersand, we're looking at the address of this um, MPI status type of variable status. Um, and so this is where it's going to record the success or failure of this receive operation. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, in the MPI underscore data type for Fortran. Oh, how do you distinguish between real four and real eight, for example? Um, because they have uh okay i haven't done fortran in a while but i think there are two different words i will answer this one there is mpi double precision for real eight thank you thank you yes i couldn't remember it and you are right okay so can i send mpi in it a bonus arg c arg b uh i'm not sure what that means so okay. if you could... in other words just Bogus. I thought it said bonus. Actual arg C arg V. Can I just? Yeah, actually, yes, you can. You can send it whatever you want. People send it. Um, people send it nothing too. Yeah, null or whatever. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Um, so the process will be executed according to their rank. Is that why the second process will have received from the zeroth one already? And. That is why this works. Okay, so the processes execute based on what their rank is, okay? So if you can imagine all of us in a group and we are numbered off, you know, one one through, uh, well, I guess because this is MPI, we've got to start at zero. So let's say zero through three, okay? So there's four of us in this group, zero through three, th through three. And there might be different instructions depending on if depending on which rank that we are, um, or depending on you know like if we're even or odd. So in the case of this program, the only thing that happens in this program is that they pair off. So rank zero and rank one, 
they pair off, they're going to send and receive from each other. Okay. Zero and one. And then two and three, they're going to pair off. They're going to hang out with each other. They're going to send and receive to each other, each other's ranks. Very exciting program. Okay. Doesn't really do anything useful except illustrate deadlocking. But so it, it's kind of, it's kind of like a weird kind of abstract thing where you have to kind of like think about these processes from their individual points of view, if you will. Uh, but that's that's how it works. Okay. What is the difference between okay? MPI send ampersand me. Oh. And MPI send me. Is there any advantage in using the ampersand? Okay. Meng Meng Yao. This is a really good question. So this is kind of a C question. So um, when I declared my variable me, okay, I made it an integer. And it's just a scalar because it's just a single integer, okay? So MPI wants you to give it the address of the thing that you're sending. It doesn't want you to give it the value. It wants to give you the address of that thing. So that's what the ampersand means. Now, if I had an array, then um, typically with an array, I wouldn't define it like this. I would define it star me, okay? Uh, it, or I might, you know, there are other ways to there are other ways to do it, but but that's the basic idea. So when I if I defined it as an array, then that me would be the address rather than the um, the the value. Okay, so if it were an array and I had defined it as int star me, then I wouldn't need this ampersand. Does that make sense? It's a it's a C or C plus plus thing, so that's kind of specific to the language. Okay, great. I'm glad that made sense. Okay, so let's see. Um, so I kind of already explained this to you, but the always deadlocking example is logically incorrect. Deadlock is caused by these blocking MPI receives. They're waiting for the MPI sent to happen, which never happens. Okay, the sometimes deadlocking example, you could have a deadlock because MPI send might not just send straight away. It could be competing for buffer space. Um, and because of that, it's dependent upon the system resources and the implementation of MPI. So it, so you shouldn't do it that way, I guess. Uh, so the solutions are reorder the sends and receives just like we, we did. Uh, you could use non-blocking sends and receives or other advanced functions. And you can look at the MPI standard and learn more. Okay, this brings us to our first exercise. So we're going to compute pi in parallel. Uh, and so the resolution here isn't very good, but this is digits of pi and creating this pi. All right. Okay. So first we're going to describe our project here about what we're going to do. I'm going to show you the serial code. We're going to talk about parallelization strategies, right? Okay. Okay, so we want to compute pi. So there is a method called the method of darts that you can use to compute pi. Okay, and the concept of it is that the ratio of the area of the of a square to the area of a circle that is inscribed within that square is proportional to pi. Now, uh, I just want to just want to highlight my disclaimer here that this is actually a really terrible way to compute pi. And please don't do it this way in real life, okay? The reason we're doing it this way is because it's so easy to understand uh, and easy to parallelize. But in real life, there are much better ways to compute that. Okay, so the method of darts. Let's imagine that we had a dartboard and uh, it is a circle of radius r inscribed in a square. So now the area of the circle, as we all hopefully know, is pi r squared, right? The area of the square, so the, the, the width of the square here is 2r, right? So that's 
quant 2r quantity squared. So that's equal to 4r squared. So if we take this ratio, the area of the circle divided by the area of the square is pi r squared over 4r squared. We'll check that out. Those r's cancel out, and we get pi over 4. OK? So we know that fact that, uh, that this, is the, this is the ratio between those two areas. So how do we find those areas? That's the question. Well, let's say that we were just throwing darts completely randomly, not trying to hit the dartboard, but trying to hit within, within that square. Uh, so we could just count the number of darts that land in the circle uh, and the total number of darts that land in the square. And we could take the ratio of those numbers and that would give us an approximation to the ratio of the areas of those two different shapes. And the quality of our approximation increases with the number of parts that we throw. OK, so that kind of makes sense. OK, um, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but I'm actually a huge nerd. And uh, in 2009, I actually celebrated Pi Day, Pi Day, best day of the year, uh, with a cake, because I like cake better than pie. But it was a method of darts cake. So you can see in this picture that's not so great. Um, there's a circ circular uh, cake on top of a square cake that had the same has the same uh, diameter as the circle. And then I decorated it with sprinkles. But I didn't actually count the number of sprinkles inside of the circle versus the total number of sprinkles, unfortunately. I'll have to just make it again sometime. OK, so does that all make sense? Any questions about the method of darts? I think it's pretty straightforward. OK, so you're like, great. Now we know how to do that. But how do we simulate this experiment on a computer, Rebecca? Come on. Um, well, actually, it's pretty easy. So we just decide on a length r, and we generate pairs of random numbers such that they are between negative r and r. And then if uh, if that pair, that, that, you know, that, that point is within the circle, so if x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to r squared, then we just add one to our tally for inside of the circle. And then finally, we just find that ratio. So see, it's not, it's not really that complicated, um, at least to do it in serial like, like we always do. OK, so in fact, I wrote you a code because I love you guys. So um, this is my code. And it finds the, it finds the, the, um, the approximate value of pi. So I have, um, I'm counting the number of, oh, well, let me start up here. So um, I have, uh, I'm going to do a million trials, OK? Um, and so far, I don't have any that made it inside of the circle. I'm just defining my variables here. I decided that r is going to be 1. It's the easiest one anyway. So of course, r squared is r times r. So I, then I'm just going through, right? For i equals 0, i is less than a number of trials. So i is going from 0 to almost a million. We're going to do it a million times. Um, I'm going to find x and y. And if they are in the circle, then I'm going to add one to the circle. I'm going to do that a million times. And then after that, I'm going to take the ratio. Okay, And this is called typecasting. If you all haven't seen that before, making this number go from a long, which is a type of integer, uh, to a double. And then that way, I get the right answers. Otherwise, I would get 0. OK, then for the um for these trials for however many trials i did i found pi is equal to this number and that's the end of my program for some reason something's trying to add a helper okay two o'clock um i'm not sure we're gonna make it to the next part 
before the break. Okay. Um, so if you're okay, this is the this is the generator. This is the random number generator. Um, and we'll talk about that at a later point, but it's generating these random numbers to simulate like that you're just randomly throwing darts. That's the basic idea. Okay, and if you are a Fortran fan, I also wrote you a Fortran code. And it does the exact same things. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how to parallelize this. Oh, okay, so William, yes, long is probably not enough. We probably need long longs, but uh, you know, we're just having fun here. <laughs> Yes, the accuracy is terrible. I mean, you need to, um, in order to get another digit of accuracy, you need to like throw a hundred times more darts sort of thing. So it's not gonna be accurate at all. It's gonna be accurate to like the first couple of digits, but not very many digits. Okay, so anyway, what tasks are we doing? Okay, so what tasks are independent of one another? Uh, what tasks have to be performed sequentially. And then we can use PCAM as our design strategy, right? Okay, so what tasks do we have here that are independent of each other? And what tasks have to be performed sequentially? Anybody wanna answer? You need uh, random numbers before you can do anything. Else. Okay, you're, th you're thinking too hard. So we're not gonna talk about random numbers at this point. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right, you're right. But um, let's say that we're actually doing the thing where we're actually throwing darts, okay? What tasks are independent of each other? Yes, each dart can be thrown independently. Throwing darts is independent. A dangerous task of throwing darts at the same time. You are right, Iraqli, that's true. <laughs> You don't want to be in the way of somebody else throwing a dart. But the idea is, right? Um, the idea is, you know, if 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 I'm gonna throw a dart and you're gonna throw a dart, in the larger scheme of things, it doesn't matter if I throw the dart first or you throw the dart first, right? Those those tasks are independent of each other because the the darts are just gonna get thrown. Okay, so that's good. So the, the biggest independent thing is throwing darts. And, and tallying it. Like I can throw my own dart and figure out like if it's in or out, right? Everybody can do that independently. My my darts in this or outness does not depend on your darts in this or outness. Okay, what tasks must be performed sequentially? So what, what do we have to do sequentially? We cannot uh, do it in any other order. This time, um, um, well, I would say, okay, so yes, we have to, uh, people are right that we, we have to uh, determine if it's in or out after throwing it, that's true. That's not what I was really thinking of, uh, but somebody here said it, do it calculating the ratio. Thank you, Andre. Doing the ratio must be done after all darts are thrown. That's right, we can't. We can't calculate the ratio before we throw the darts or halfway through. We have to wait until they're all finished. So those are the big uh, sequential tasks is throwing all the darts and figuring that out and then taking the ratio. Good. Uh, okay, are darts allowed to land outside the square? Okay, in real life, I imagine if we were doing this thing, they might land outside the square. Uh, in our program, we are guaranteeing that they won't because we're guaranteeing that all um, random numbers are gonna be from negative one to one. Okay, so let's talk about using PCAM to design this. So PCAM, if you recall, first thing is partition. So we're gonna decompose our problem into fine-grained tasks to maximize the potential for parallelism. So now the finest grained task that we kind of have here is the throwing of, of a single dart, right? Each throw is independent of all the others. Um, so if we had like a huge computer, we could assign one throw to each processor, right? We had a million 
node machine. Each of the nodes could do one throw and, and then we would get it all done with. Okay, so our next step is about communication. So we want to determine our communication pattern among our tasks. So the communication pattern is what we had talked about before, this manager worker sort of a of a, an algorithm where each processor throws the darts and then it's going to send the results back to the manager process. Okay. So next is agglomeration. So this is where we're starting to be practical. So we're going to combine in the coarser grain tasks to reduce communication requirements or other costs. So uh, in order to get a good value of pi, we have to use, a mil use millions of darts. Uh, we don't have millions of processors available. I actually only reserved 100. Sorry, guys, I forgot. Um, but seriously, uh, we, don't, we don't have uh, millions of processors available. Uh, and even if we did, then we would be doing a million communications. And we've already talked about how MPI communications are extremely inefficient compared to the speed of a processor. Um, like you could have a single processor computing this much faster than you could have it receiving a million communications. So um, instead what we wanna do is, we just wanna use a few processes and we want to uh, divide up the number of dart throws evenly between them so that each one just does a share of the work. All right, so finally we talk about mapping. So we want to assign tasks to processors uh, subject to the trade-off between communication costs and concurrency. So typically we just assign the role of manager to the first processor to number zero. Uh, and so zero will be in charge. They'll receive all the tallies from all the other processors and they'll compute the final value of pi. Uh, and every processor, including the manager will perform an equal share of dart throws. Um, the, the reason for this is because the, the overhead for being the manager is so small. <laughs> they just have to do one thing. They have to receive all these and then um, do one little division thing. Um, but in, in other cases where the, the managerial tasks were actually much harder uh, and much more complicated, more involved, you might want to reduce the load of work on the manager, um, just like you do in, in real life. Uh, so. I'm a manager. I don't do much work of, of the technical work anymore. I do a lot less than everyone else in my group of the technical work because I got other things I got to do. Okay. But uh, in this case, like I said, it's so little overhead to be the manager that it's not that big a deal. We'll just make everybody do the same amount of work. Okay. So now we're on to the nitty gritty here. So clone the assignment from um, the repository that we have. And then we're gonna copy the darts.c and lc generator to a different directory. And we're gonna write the- uh, Rebecca, are you casting your screen or your terminal? Right now, all I have is just my screen up and I'm just showing people the instructions. Okay, so that is this is what we're going to do. Any questions about what we're going to do? And then we can do it. Okay, so I'm going to have to, I think, new share. Let me see which one I'm looking for. This is the one I want to show. Okay. Okay, can you see my terminal? Yes. Everybody excited to see my terminal. Okay, so CD to scratch. 
All right, I'm already on Corey. I'm a CDG my scratch directory. And I'm gonna follow my own instructions here. But doing this. Oh good, go me. See me crash or supercomputing. Okay, so now at this level, I've got a C directory and a Fortran directory. And in my C directory, I have um, darts.c and lcgenerator.h. Those are the files that I want. Um, there's also answers in here. They're not necessarily the best answers, just to be clear. <laughs> they're probably bad answers, uh, but they're codes that, you know, that work, that uh, do what, what is being done here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, let's see, I'm gonna copy darts.c, lcgenerator.h. I'm gonna copy them to, just gonna copy them to my scratch directory, just that home place. And then I'm just going to change my directory to there. And you can see here it is. I just copied those over. All right. So now I wanted to make um, darts-mpi.c, right? So here's my thing. OK. Um, all right, so this is the actually the serial code. Um, so the first thing I need to do is I need to include mpi.h. Okay, those are the header files for MPI. And I'm paranoid, so I'm going to save it at every possible juncture here. Uh, those are the header files for MPI. And uh, and so it does contain all of the functions that I need, uh, the function declarations for all of the MPI that I need. Okay, so uh, then the next easy thing to do is uh, MPI init. Uh, And then I'm going to MPI finalize at the bottom. See, so I've already done what I said I was going to do in my programs, right? Um, I'm going to come back here and look at these codes because, oh, not those codes, these codes. Let's do this one. OK, so I've got my pound include MPI to H. I've got my MPI init and my MPI finalize. So this is already an MPI code. I could run it right now. And what it would do is it would run, uh, you know, n versions of it for n equals the number of uh, MPI processes that I choose. It would just run the same thing n times. That's all it does right now. Okay, so how can I divide up this work, right? So the work is in this, this loop here, right? That's where all my work is at. So how can I divide it up? Anybody have any ideas? Oh, there's lots of chats here. Uh, okay, after we log in and put in our password, what step do we need to do next before we get clones on the password? Uh, you can just, uh, Curie, to answer your question, you can just CD to any old directory that you want to be in and then just get clone the repository. Okay, yes, people are on the right track here on what to do. do you, so we want to um, 
take the total number of trials and divide it by the, the size, the, num the, the number of processes that we have in our MPI communicator. That is correct. That is what we want to do. Okay, so let's, uh, so in order to do that, we need to know our rank and size, right? So int, rank, and size. Okay, we we'll probably need a few extra auxiliary things like uh, it, oh, well, it's going to be long, my num trials. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we'll figure it out. I'm sure we need more things now, but we'll we'll do this. Okay, so we've got MPI init. Then, um, then we can do MPI um, size, and that is yes, MPI um, world. This MPI com rank. MPI com. Sorry about that. Uh, world and rank. Okay, so now I've got my the size and my rank. I'm sure those are going to come in important somewhere. Okay, so then um, the amount of work that I'm going to do, I need to do the number of trials divided by the size, right? So uh, my num trials equals uh, num trials divided by size. Okay, is that always going to work? Uh, what if size equals three? Ah, yes, Alfred says a million must be divisible by n. Okay, that's true uh, unless we um, do something to fix it. If we find out that there's a remainder, we can just tack it on to another um another run right yeah right we can so so we'll we'll use the, we'll get the number of trials and we'll modular modulo the uh the size mm -hmm. or sorry or the, no the yeah the size and if it's mm -hmm. greater than zero we'll just tack that on to the last one okay yeah that's one way to do it that would work here um because these are really trivial but if, yeah. if we had tasks that were hard, then we would want to distribute them a little bit better. Yeah, we would want to distribute them um, mm -hmm. as best as we could. Yep. Okay. So let's do let's do it that way then. Okay. Let's see. Um, so uh, another way that you can do it, which actually is the way that I usually do it when I run this, when I do this, is um, if rank is less than Yes, less than um, num trials modulo size. See, that's the remainder, right? Then my num trials plus plus. That's the way I usually do it because then that each of them gets one extra piece of work instead of one getting up to uh, rank num rank minus one extra pieces of work, or I mean, sorry, size minus one, <laughs> getting myself confused too. Okay, does that make sense? So what I did was if my rank is, so let's say that there are, there, uh, there's a remainder of, of one, okay? Then I need to give one piece of work to somebody. So if my rank is less than one, which is rank zero, so rank zero would get one extra piece of work. Um, 
which is not ideal, I guess, if if because that's the manager. But in this case, it doesn't really matter. Um, if the if the um, if if the remainder is two, then rank is less than two. Then zero and one are going to get piece of work each. So that's two pieces of work. So that still works. If uh, if the remainder is zero, uh, then there is no rank that is less than zero. So nobody will get extra work. So actually we could do it, we could do it this way to assure that we have, uh, let's see, size minus rank. If size minus rank is, I gotta figure out if this is less than, or equal to, I think it's less than or equal to. Now, why do I think that? Let's see, if, mm, that's not gonna work. Shoot, I've never, never tried this before. Um, size minus rank, I think minus one. Then that works. Okay, so if, so size, let's say our size is, I don't know, our size is three uh, minus my rank minus another one. Is less than, okay, so if I'm rank, so our size is three, my rank is two. And there is a remainder that I'm going to get it. If size is three, my rank is one. Um, then three minus one is two minus another one is one. Uh, okay. And... Yep, I think that works. I think that works. I think I've evenly distributed them and the manager is not gonna be the one who's gonna get the extra work. But yes, that was a good good suggestion. Okay, do we have a lot more questions and things? Okay, all right, well. Um, questions in the Google Doc have been answered and I think you're monitoring the Zoom chat yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Num trials. Okay, Leon Leandro. It's actually at the very top. Num trials is at the top. It's a global variable. Uh so Alfred, yes. If I am using two of the X processors, then num trials equals two to the Y will work. But that isn't exactly how I had this set up. So I'm allowing for us to use non powers of two. Okay, so somebody asked me about num trials. It's up here. It's a global variable. It's bad programming practice, but it is what it is. Okay, so now I am going to do my work, right? I'm just going to do my num trials here. Okay. All right, so let me try to explain everything that I've done so far. I added these MPI things. So first I added MP, include MPI to H. Then I added MPI init. And I added uh, MPI finalize, okay? Then I knew like, I am gonna need to know the size and the rank, okay? Because we already figured that out, right? Like the size is is gonna be, the number of pieces that we're dividing our work up into, right? That's what the size is gonna be. And so my work that an individual processor, I am an individual processor, is gonna do, is gonna be this number of total trials divided by the size. So divided by the number of different processes that are there to be able to do the work. This line here is just, uh, an extra line to make sure that everything is performed, no matter uh, whether 
the uh, num trials is divisible by the number of MPI processes or not. That's all, that's what this is here for. That's what this line is for, okay? Now here, I changed this to, instead of num trials, to my num trials so that I do only my share of the work, okay? Okay, so when I've done my share of the work, then what needs to happen? I need to send it to the manager process, right? That's what I need to do next. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you for answering these questions here. So the end circ is if if I'm inside of the circle, then I'm going to add one to end circ. So that is end circ is like my count of of things that land inside of the circle. Okay. Okay, so um, when do size and rank get initialized? Uh, they are initialized for here. That's when I set those values. Oh, oh, you mean, okay, but they're up here too. Yeah, I defined them. I thought you were like saying I didn't define them. I did define them up there. All right, so Michael Hines, you are correct. If I'm not a manager, I'm going to send my end circ. If I am the manager, I'm going to receive it and I'm going to add them all together and compute the final ratio. Yes, sir, that is correct. Okay, so now we need to figure that out. So if rank is not equal to zero, I think we can just do it like that. If my rank is not equal to zero, then what do I need to do? Oh, this likes to those like that. Interesting. So I need to uh okay, I really don't like the way that they do this. One, two, three. I need to MPI send. Okay, and I am sending my N circ. It is one number. It is MPI long. And I am sending it to the manager. You know, I really should do this correctly. And I should initialize manager up here. I could just hear my computer science teachers crying when I was not doing that. Okay. Okay, so I'm sending it to the manager. Uh, I am I need a tag. I'm just going to use my rank as a tag. And then I'm going to do MPI com world because that is the world in which I am sending it. Okay, so if I'm not the manager, that's all I have to do, right? There's nothing else I need to do. Is there? Nope. Oops. Or else, if I am the manager, what do I need to do? I need to receive. Okay. Okay, so first, let me just put comments here. Receive from all other processes. Add them all up. Compute pi. Print pi. Right? That's what I have to do if I am the manager. So actually, all these things down to here go into what I need to do when I am the manager, right? Y'all agree with me? Okay, so first I need to receive from all other processes. So I need to write a loop 
That's the easiest way. Okay, so let's say int k. Let's just go with that for k equals one. I don't have to receive from myself, do I? No. For k equals one, k less than size, k plus plus. MPI receive. I need a I need a place to receive it, don't I? Uh, let's call it temp. MPI long. K. K. MPI um, world and status. Okay, you can see I'm missing some variables here. Okay, so this is just, uh, I'm gonna receive it into this temporary buffer here, right? So I need a temporary buffer on temp. Okay, um, K is the, the rank of who I'm receiving it from. And then that is the tag of the one that I'm receiving it from. MPI com world, that's the world in which we are living and communicating. And then status, I don't have that. That's MPI status. Okay. Okay, so then after I receive that from someone, I need to uh, add it to my NSERC, right? And that is what I need to do. So I have I have uh, received them and actually added them all up. And then down here I'm computing pi. And then I'm printing it. Okay. Does anybody? Uh, let's see. Do we have more comments? I'm sure we've got more comments. I'm confused by the random number generator. Oh, is it going to really return uniformly distributed random numbers between negative one and one? Or is that not what we need with the given pi algorithm? Okay, excellent question. If, should we be initializing the random number for each process? Another excellent question, Scott. And why are we using size against rank? Should we be receiving once for each other process? We sure should. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate you correcting me. It, let's see. We are, let's see. Oh, I think I was right. So size is the total number of receives, right? So if I, um, let's say if I have, uh, five processes, um, then size is five, okay? So when I'm receiving here, I'm the manager, I'm gonna receive from one, two, three, and four, and I'm zero. So, uh, so that's a total number of five. So I've received five total. Okay, sometimes I get that confused too. It's easy to confuse size and rank. Okay, um, so, we had some excellent questions here. Okay, you think I have not added rank zero result into NSERC? I have because I've already computed zeros NSERC up here. Okay. Yep, good. All right, now for send, uh, we might be missing a status. No, we don't need a status. For send, we just need a status for receive. If you look here, there are no status on send. There's just a status on receive. Okay. Um, is the loop for receiving process serial? Can we make it parallel? Ching, that is an excellent question. Uh, and not with the tools that we currently have. We cannot make that receiving parallel, but we will be able to 
with advanced MPI. Okay. Do I mean MPI sum? No, I don't mean MPI sum. <laughs> um, but you all have good questions. Okay, so um, we had some questions here about the random number generator, and that is actually part of my shtick about it. Okay, so the random number generator, what it does is it actually, it produces um, numbers that are in a really large sequence, and then it divides them to normalize them uh, be to between zero and one or between negative one and one or whatever that you want. Um, in our case, what we're doing is we're gonna have them all be between zero and one uh, because if you think about it, if you have a, if you have a, a dartboard, it, it, is, it is symmetric, right? So if you just divided it up into four quadrants and you just did, you focused only on one quadrant, you would get the same answer as if you did the whole dartboard. So that's why we're really only focusing on numbers between zero and one. Okay, now someone asks, should we be initializing the random number for each process? And Scott, you are correct, my friend. That was one of my party tricks. I was gonna show you that when we ran this, uh, that it would actually produce a really crappy, <laughs> worse results, uh, the more processes we used. And that's precisely why, because essentially instead of, instead of doing, uh, let's say four separate, um, you know, four sequences of, of, of numbers independently, it would be doing the same sequence uh, four times, uh, the same sequence of random numbers four times. So that, so you, you kind of spoiled my trick, but, Uh, but yeah. Um, so let's see, does the for loop of MPI receive ex implicitly assumes manager equals zero? Um, so this for loop here, yes, this for loop gets executed only by the manager, right? Okay. And I did define manager, I believe, if we look up here, I decide I defined manager as zero. So if I'm not the manager, I just send a bunch of messages. Okay. If I am the manager, then I receive all of the messages. So I should rephrase. If I'm not the manager, I send my message. I send a single message. If I am the manager, I I I receive all the messages from everyone else. Right, okay. but you you loop through ranks one to size, right? So that yep. you're, so if if manager was any, if rank zero was not the manager, then you would never receive rank zeros sum. That's a good point. That's a good point. So I guess, I guess we just have to assume that zero is always the manager. I mean, that's pretty customary anyway. That's true. I guess I could do like 4k equals zero, k less than size, and then in here have, if k doesn't equal manager or whatever, then do this. But I didn't do that. Um, that would that would be um, something that the compiler would have a hard time optimizing away. So it's usually easier to just have manager equals zero, but that's a really good point. Thank you for bringing it up. Okay, so we were talking about our uh, random numbers. Shouldn't we be, okay, so I, I'm going back to Scott here who, who figured out the trick before I even showed you. Shouldn't we be initializing the random number for each process? And the answer is yes, we should. Yes, we should. Um, let me just scroll down to the bottom portion. Is that good? Okay, can't 
oops, can't stay forever here. So if I go back up to the top here, I defined manager right there. Okay, so let's look at, um, sorry, everybody, I'm gonna go look at this other thing for a second. So let's look at LC generator each. Okay, so it initializes itself with this random last. And this is how it computes these. So um, this is called a linear congruential generator. It's actually kind of a bad uh, random number generator, but we're just using it anyway. Um, and so what these do is they, uh, so these three, these three things, uh, the multiplier, the add end, and the PMOD, those are um, mutually prime numbers. I mean, so they're not prime numbers, as you can see, but they are prime from each other. Um, and so what it does is it uses these uh, in this following way to, um, to compute a number that is between zero and uh, 714,025. Um, and then it, the return value is that number, whatever that is, divided by 714,025. Uh, and so that gives you a number between zero and one. Okay, so uh, linear congruential generators are just really easy to understand. So that's why we're using this. Um, so you can see that this random last, it, it gets initialized to zero. Uh, so first it's zero, then it's some other number, then it's some other number, but it's always the same sequence of numbers as you can see because there's really no such thing as an actual random number generator. The things that you see are pseudo random number generators. They're just a sequence of numbers that is so long and doesn't have an obvious pattern. So you, it makes you think it's random, okay? Um, so uh, we're all starting at this zero. So that means that if, if I'm a process and you're a process and we're doing this, this, uh, this dart throwing business, then we both are throwing the exact same darts every time, unless we start from a different point in the sequence, then we'll be throwing somewhat unique darts, okay? So the simplest thing that we can do is set this random last to be the rank of our particular self. So if we go back here and we, and we come out here and we can, um, oops, <laughs> that was the old one. I was like, where did all my MPI yeah, go? Okay, uh, right here we can do, um, oh shoot, I got so distracted. I forgot what it's called. I think it's random next. I'll go back and check it equals rank. Okay. Random last. Thank you. Random last. And it was four letters. Okay, thank you. Random last equals rank. So then what that'll do is that'll start us off in different locations in the uh, in this sequence. However, keep in mind the sequence was only 750,000 or whatever. And we're doing a million trials. So it's, we're really not going to get a very accurate answer here. Um, no is random last a global variable so that it can be accessed by the function? I'm sorry, what? Can you say again? Is, is random last a global variable so that it can be accessed by the function? Yeah, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so let's see if I can compile this and if it'll it'll at least compile. So let's see, cc. So start slash MPI. That's MPI, let's see. Okay, let me cross your fingers. Let's see if Rebecca got it right. Oh, I got something right, okay. So my job, uh, it actually compiled, or, or my, I'm sorry, my code compiled. So that means I didn't have any obvious syntax errors or anything, but uh, it could still be wrong. 
So let's come back here. Let's look at our logistics. And let's see how to run our job. Okay, so if I want to use the reservation, which of course I do, then I want to use this in order to get myself a node. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to do s alloc four, and then um, I I don't like typing. That's too much typing. Oh, well, I didn't put in the uh, architecture. No. Oh, OK, no. Mm -hmm. ah. Thanks, Helen. <laughs> Thank goodness you're here to uh, straighten me out. <laughs> OK, here we go. Now I'm getting it. Third time's a charm. OK, let's see how, let's see how my my code runs, okay. Okay, so I have one node. I'm on I'm on the node right now. So if I do s run, minus n one, first I'm gonna run it in serial, okay? Start dash MPI, let's see how I got, let's see how we go. Okay, see, there we are, I computed pi. I got pi is equal to 3.141648. Uh, okay, so you can see I, I'm off. I start being off like here. So, but that's not unexpected. Okay, um, now let's try it with, um, with two. Okay, cross your fingers. Let's see if I got it right here. Wow. Okay. It's um definitely off. Not sure exactly why. I don't think that uh, my algorithm is wrong, but You got, okay, so Christian got the same results. And okay, so Vedan, you were asking, should the MPI finalize be placed above the printf commands? Uh, no, uh, it should be placed right before you quit. That's where it belongs. Okay, uh, Maria asks, what's the difference between running S run and MPI run? Um, so on our machines, we just use S run. Yeah, it's it's for Slurm. Uh, MPI run. Um, it's actually not something that you ever run use on a on a Cray computer. Basically, um, they have kind of their own stuff. All right. Now, why is my N three just like hanging here forever? I don't understand what's happening. Uh, what's the MPI Fortran call on Corey? Oh, FTN. FTN is the name of the Fortran compiler. Rebecca, add a dash C for something for N3 so that it's not off with the affinity. <sighs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. You're probably right. Okay. So if I, I add a, a dash C, what? Four. Four? Let's give it one process for uh, one, one physical call for a process. Like that? Yes. Okay. Ideally, at dash dash CPU bind equals cores, because three is not divisible by sixty eight, and it's becoming. Bad. Oh, of course. Okay. Okay. So. Equals cores. Oops. Like that. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so Andre, I see you say the Fortran compiler says it cannot open the MPI.f file. So that suggests that you need to use um, FTN. Make sure that you're using FTN as the right. Uh, FTN is the right MPI Fortran compiler. I just wrote it in. Oh, I'm sorry. I wrote it as a direct message. Sorry. That was a mistake. That wasn't meant to be a direct message. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. William just wrote it. Thank you. FTN. Okay. Why is it not working? <laughs> I don't know. Best to use two to the power of the number of ranks. Okay. I'll do that. I'll try four. Not 45, four. Oh, it quit. My job quit. Student, it's a time limit. Okay, I think I guess I just had a 10 minute time limit. Okay. Well, so what we would expect to see with three, if it were actually working, is you would just see another, uh, you know, just another result like this, where it would give us a value of pi. That's all. Okay, well, you know what, y'all, uh, we were supposed to like stop at 2.30 after our second lesson, but we got like way too into it. So uh, why don't we take a break until three? So that gives us like 10 minutes. Sorry about that. And then at three, we will come back and we will start the second part. So um, I think probably everybody needs to have a little break and let their brain not hurt quite as much if that sounds good to you all. So I'm gonna stop sharing for the moment and I'll let y'all have a break and we'll see you back here at three o'clock, top of the hour. So if, if you're doing reservation, uh, the uh, hands-on, check the readme file and there's a run SSH um, scripts. There's also a batch script that you can follow. There's a make file you can follow with compilation. There's a, those scripts you can follow with uh, running the jobs and probably just, because around all that SH has everything, you want to just uh, capture a part of it that is relevant to the exercise right now. There's a uh, flags to use for, for the reservations in those readme files as well and batch script. Um, Rebecca, you might want to help uh, Maria uh, with uh, SSH login problem. I'll help. Okay, I'll take a look. Is this in the... Rebecca, in the second half, do you still want to uh, monitor the chat message? And then we're actually like putting these chat message into the Google q and I we see could encourage that. people to use Google Q&A. And then you, if you are able to monitor those live, that'll be probably easier. Yeah, the hard part is because I've got the slides <clears throat> up fully mm -hmm. that I can't, I can't see anything else. Okay. If you so can, then sure. do it, and and we can bring up the questions uh, that need to answer from Google Doc to you. Okay, that sounds perfect.
All right, it is um, it is time, I think, to get back to it. So thanks to you all for sticking with me here. Let's see, let me share my screen once again. Okay, everybody's asking lots of good questions. Really, really happy about that. Continue asking questions. Make sure I'm not muted. Oh, I'm not muted. Okay. <laughs> I was like, am I talking to the air? No, I'm not. Okay, good. All right. So we're going to move on, unfortunately, because we we're like way later than I had hoped we would be. So we're going to talk about um, MPI collectives. Okay. So um, the, the, the things that we've learned right now, they were just point to point communications. Uh, you know, so from one process to another, communicating. Uh, but there are these collectives that involve groups of processes. So we're going to learn these different collective operations, including broadcast operations, um, gather operations, scatter, reduce, alls, and barrier. Okay, so broadcast is a useful operation. So maybe you need to send a message from the manager to all worker processes. So you could send individual messages or you could use the broadcast, which is more efficient and faster. And, and so this is the function prototype. So again, we've got the same concept. We've got this buffer that we are going to send out. Um, this count has a, is the size, so how many items are in the buffer of the data type here. The root, that is, um, that is where the message is originating from. And then the MPI communicator. Um, now, the reason a broadcast is more efficient than sending out, you know, like we, uh, you know, like you could do four I equals one to uh, size or whatever, you could do that. But the reason you don't want to do that is broadcast is more efficient. It uses this tree-like structure to communicate. So what happens is, you know, the message originates here and then it sends to two friends who then send to two more friends, who each of them then send two more friends, et cetera until the message gets all the way through. So that's why that's why broadcast is more efficient. Um, instead of taking N messages to send the message to everyone, it takes the log of N messages to send to everyone. So much more efficient in that way. Okay, so then maybe instead of we wanna send a message out, maybe we wanna receive a message. Okay, that's, um, it may have, we may have done that recently, right? <laughs> we, we received a whole bunch of messages that were exactly the same type of message. So we could implement this again with everyone calls MPI send and the manager loops through MPI receive like we just did. Uh, instead, we should use the gather operation because it's more efficient and it's a lot faster. Uh, and, and again, it's using that tree structure instead of, instead of broadcasting out, it's you know bringing the messages in, gathering them in to a single rank. So, the messages will be received and they will be concatenated in rank order. And so this is the form of the of it. So you have a send buffer. This is the buffer in which you are sending the message. Uh, and then, uh, the, I'm sorry, this is the buffer in which the message that is to be sent is located. Uh, and then this send count is the size of that message, how many items of this data type there are within that message. Then there's a receive buffer. And so that is for the, the, the root, which we'll see down here. The root, when you know what they are gonna receive all of this stuff into. And then there's the receive count. And that is the number of items that are received from each process, not the total number of items. Uh, and then of course the receive data type is being received by this root. And then they are communicating through this communicator. Okay. Uh, so sometimes though you might have a case where some processes actually need to send a longer message than other processes. And so we can do that with uh, the gather V. V stands for variable. So it's basically the same form as gather. It's just a little bit different. And then this receive counts um, right here. Normally that would be uh, just a scalar number. 
but that is uh, an array where entry i in the displacement array, this, this array here, specifies the displacement relative to receive buff zero at which to place the data from the corresponding process number, okay? Uh, you know, I think you could probably find examples of this. I'm not gonna go into ter terribly great detail today. I know it sounds a little confusing, but I think you can understand the concept of, of gather versus gather V. And that's really all I'm striving for here rather than that you can go out and write a program using gather V. Okay, uh, so then there's scatter. So maybe you have a big long message and you wanna split it up into little pieces and the ith segment of, of it gets sent to the ith process in the group. So there's a function for that. There's MPI scatter. Uh, so you have a send buffer where this, that's the location of the stuff that you want to send out. Uh, you have a send count, which is the size of that. Um, and then the type. Uh, and then there's a receive buffer that all of the other processes that are receiving from it are going to get. Uh, and a count of the size of what they're receiving and the data type. And then the root, where this, where this scatter is originating from and the communicator. And of course, we've got a scatter, we've got a scatter V. Okay, I'm not gonna go into the details of that one either, but just understand that you there's different uh, ways that you can do this. So if you have a constant size message, you can use scatter. If you have variable size message, you use scatter V. Okay, this function, I think we would all find especially useful to, for today. So maybe we need to do the sum of many subsums owned by all processors. That sounds familiar. Sounds like something that we just did. Or maybe we need to find the maximum value of all variables across all processors, of, of a particular variable, sorry, across all processors. Um, so we can do for either of these things or many other things, we can perform a global reduce operation across all group members. So MPI reduce is the function that we will use. And so we have the send buffer, which is the, the location of the data that we are gonna send. And we have a receive buffer, which is the location where it's gonna be received by the root. And then this count, of course, is the size. And the data type is right here. And then this op, that's the operation that we're using in our reduction. So in this case, the sum, in this case, the maximum. And then of course, we're going all across our communicator. Okay, so there's different predefined operations, okay? So the ones that you're probably gonna use are, you know, in your life probably, are this, are, you know, from here and up. So like the maximum value, the minimum value, some are the product. Those are the most likely ones that anybody's going to use. Then there's uh, there's these ones, max lock and min lock. So so those have to do with you get the maximum value and the location of the maximum value. So which process that it is on. So there's a little more details here. Um, so it returns the maximum or the minimum and the rank of the first process it encountered with that value. So you use it with these special MPI pair data type arguments. So like float int, double int, long int, two int. Um, and for more details, of course, you can see the MPI standard. Now you can also define your own reduction operators by using MPI op create. Uh, you can see the MPI standard to learn more about how you do that. We're not gonna cover that today. Okay. now. So a lot of these things that we've done, we've talked about, you have, uh, you know, you're, you're like doing a gather, let's say, or a scatter or a reduce, uh, and, it, and it only ends up on one process, on the root, right? Or it originates from the root. Um, so maybe you want everyone to have the results of gather, scatter, or reduce. So there's the MPI all gather, and all gather V, okay? And these are the same as gather, except that the answer ends up everywhere 
instead of just on the root process. Okay. Now, there's the all to all. And this one can totally mess with your brain if, if you're, yeah, if it's, uh, you know, late in the afternoon on a, on a Tuesday. So the all gather uh, is where each process sends distinct data to each receiver. And then um, it's very, it can be very confusing. The all to all is where um, if I'm a process, I send data to every other process and every other process sends something back to me. Now you may say, why would you ever do that? And you know, it makes your brain hurt so bad to even think about that. Well, actually it is, it is um, widely used in, in applications like, for example, astrophysics, where they're simulating the whole universe, right? And so they divide it up into these blocks. Now, unfortunately for, for these simulations, uh, gravity, for example, uh, impacts everyone from every other, um, every other block. So if I have a block over here, the gravity of this block is pulling on a block that's way down here. Like they're all pulling on each other. So they all uh, have some component of gravitational force that is interacting with every other component. So that is an example of an application where I would want to send, here is the power of gravity on, on um, all of the other blocks in, in this simulation from my block. And they would all want to send me the power of the gravity that is happening that is interacting with my block from them as well. So that's that's one example. Um, and so you have all to all, and we also have all to all V with, with variable size of messages that we are sending to everyone else. Okay, so all reduce, again, we did MPI reduce before. All reduce is the exact same thing except for that the result of the reduce appears on all processes instead of just a root process. Okay, oh, excuse me. Um, and then there's one, this is the last one, it's a collective operation in some sense because it's a barrier. So sometimes you might need to synchronize your processes um, and the barrier will block until all group members have called it. So everyone is just hanging out there, hanging out there, hanging out there until all the processes get to the MPI barrier. And once they get there, then it, then your code moves on from that point. Now, um, it's very rare to actually really need to have a barrier. Um, a lot of times people have a barrier because uh, it solves some kind of a problem or a bug in their algorithm. So if that's the case, you probably need to rethink your algorithm rather than have a barrier if you can avoid it. Um, but anyway, that's that's kind of the, the reason behind most people's usage of barriers. Okay, so that's, that is my summary of, of collective MPI operations. Um, if you're really interested in MPI, there's some really great resources online. Um, this tutorial at Livermore from Livermore is a really good MPI tutorial. Actually, I learned a lot about MPI from that tutorial myself. And if you need a little light reading, you're not getting enough sleep at night, you want something to help you to sleep, then you should look at the MPI standard at the MPI forum. That, that especially the 800 page ones down here, those will definitely help you to sleep at night. Okay. Any questions before we move on? Any? Um, okay, so yes, uh, Assis, I see your message to me. Yes, it is SSH, whatever your training name is, at corey.nurse.gov. Yes. Uh, okay, 
So yes, the question about collectives, everyone calls the same function for all these cases. Yep, that's right. Every Everything, so when it's like MPI, um, yeah, like MPI reduce, everyone calls MPI reduce. That's exactly right. What, the tutorial is no longer there? I swear I just checked it. That is very heartbreaking if it's no longer there. They may have reorganized their pages. Um, I'll have to follow up with them because I do know them. I have to like, make sure that it's there. Is it a different link? Okay, they reorganized. Okay, I'll have to fix that link. Alrighty, so let's talk about computing pi with MPI collectives. Um, so previously we used the six basic MPI routines for our parallel program using the method of darts, compute pi. Um, we could make our communications a lot more efficient if we use collectives instead of what we use. So our assignment is updating our MPI code to use collectives. And we can rename it darts-collective.c or .f. Okay, so let's discuss this about how would, how would we change it. Um, what what MPI collective could we use in order to uh, actually make this pretty trivial? As you remember, I said it was um, I said it was you can write anything with those six MPI uh, um, functions, but maybe not the most efficient kind. We we had to do a lot of extra work. Um, and the reason was because we did not use MPI reduce, right? We could use MPI reduce. Yeah, we could use gather instead of a loop, but however, gather still gives us just an array that we then need to add up. Okay, but if we use reduce, then it adds it for us. Okay. Yeah, that's why we want to use reduce. Okay, so um, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to actually do it, but you can look in the um, in the um, thing that you got from Git. There's an answer there with an MPI reduce in it. It shows you how to do it. Okay, but actually, it's kind of almost easier to start from scratch and just um, and just do MPI reduce in the first place instead of having to make that horrible loop that we had to make with the MPI receives and stuff like that, right? That was terrible. Um, so gather, just other codes would be for more complex operations just than just add or max. Okay, um, yeah, so, so gather, I mean, it's just a different application, right? I mean, if you don't need to take all of those, like maybe you have to do something individually with each piece of that information, then that, that it would make sure to use, it would make sense to use gather. Um, but if you can use reduce, because all of those, um, all of that data is gonna be reduced into a single answer, then it would make sense to just go ahead and use reduce. Yes, and gather provides more details so that you can examine the result. That is true. Mm -hmm. So yes, if you needed to examine each one or something, then then you would want to want to use gather. Uh, if you just want to squish them all into one output, then re use reduce. Okay, so let's go on into the next part, if I can. Okay, so we're going to talk about OpenMP and hybrid programming. So I'm really glad that Helen He is here with us today, helping answer the questions. I'm just going to brag on Helen for a minute. Uh, 
Oh, I don't have it here. I have it in my office at work. Helen is the author of a book about OpenMP and the OpenMP Common Core, which is kind of the simplest parts of OpenMP that people would most commonly use. So Helen is an expert. So I'm going to say things. And if Helen contradicts me, Helen is right and I am wrong. Oh, it's with Tim Madison, who is the grandfather of OpenMP. <laughs> well, see, there we go. She even like knows the grandfather of OpenMP. But I think she deserves a lot of credit for helping to write that book. It's very impressive. Okay, so we'll talk about OpenMP. So um, OpenMP is the industry standard for shared memory programming model, okay? It was first developed in 1997. There is an OpenMP architecture review board, ARB, and they determine the additions and updates to the standard. Current standard is at 5.2. That was just released this past November. Uh, and the standard does include GPU offloading ever since 4.5, but we're not, we're not gonna talk about uh, GPUs today. Okay, so here are some things that are really great about OpenMP. So you can parallelize small parts of an application one at a time, beginning with the most time critical parts without having to do, you know, huge things or, you know, a lot of gymnastics in order to get there. Uh, OpenMP can be used to express very simple or even very complex algorithms. Uh, when you add OpenMP parallelization to your code, the size of your code grows only modestly. I mean, do you remember when we added MPI into our code there, it like doubled the length of it, right? With OpenMP, uh, actually, I think we just have, you'll see, I think we'll just add maybe two, three lines. That's all we'll have to do. Uh, the expression of parallelism, it, it really flows clearly, so it makes your code really easy to read. Uh, and you can use a single source code for OpenMP and non-OpenMP. OpenMP is sort of in the form of directives, um, and so you can you can just have your compiler ignore those directives if it if you don't want to use uh, OpenMP. Okay, so the OpenMP programming model. So the API is a combination of directives, uh, runtime library routines, and environment variables. And these API components um, can fall into the following three categories. So expression of parallelism, you can think of that as flow control, uh, data sharing among threads or communication, and synchronization or coordination or interaction between the threads. So this is the um, this is the model of of parallelism. It is shared memory, thread based parallelism. It is explicit. You have parallel regions, and it uses this fork and join model. Okay, and so if there, if, so this came from this Livermore computing thing. I'm going to have to update that URL, I suppose, also. Uh, but they have a really excellent OpenMP tutorial in addition to their MPI tutorial. Okay, so first we're going to talk about OpenMP directives. And like, I think I would have lost my nerd card if I had the word directive and I didn't talk about the Star Trek prime directive, right? I don't know what would happen to me if I didn't mention that. Okay, anyway, so we're going to go, we're going to start with a syntax overview. Uh, then we're going to talk about a few uh, directives. So, okay, if you're a C or a C++ person, this is your basic format. It is the pound or the hash, uh, depending on where you're from, that, that uh, symbol, and then pragma, OMP, and then the name of the directive. There might be a clause involved and then a new line. Okay, all of our directives end with a new line and it uses the pragma construct. So pragma is the Greek word for thing done. I looked that up, I don't know why. Uh, it is case sensitive. So all caps and lowercase are two different things. Uh, and the directives 
just follow the standard C++ or C compiler directives rules. Uh, if you use curl, you can use curly braces to denote the scope of a directive. Uh, the curly braces need to be not on the same line with the pragma. If they are, um, then it, it won't it won't understand it. So they need to be on a separate line. And if you have a really long directive line, you can continue it using the escaping new line character. So a backslash and then enter. Now, if you're a Fortran person, then your basic format is you have a sentinel and the directive name and a clause. Now, there are three accepted sentinels. So there's the um, exclamation dollar sign OMP, star dollar sign OMP, or C dollar sign OMP. And then some directives have an end clause. Now, if you're a fixed form Fortran person, Say that five times fast. Uh, any of those three sentinels you can use, and they has to they have to begin in the first column, uh, and then there is a space or a zero in column six, and then a continuation or a directive continuation line has a non-space or a non non-zero in column six, uh, and then. Standard, you have to follow the standard rules for fixed form, line length, and spaces, and all that stuff. Now, hopefully, people aren't using too much fixed form Fortran anymore. So, if you're using free form, then the uh, exclamation dollar sign OMP is the only sentinel that you can use in free form. Uh, it can be in any column, but it has to be preceded only by white space and then followed by a space. Uh, and then if you're going to continue lines, you have to end in an ampersand, and the following line begins with the sentinel. And then, of course, your standard freeform Fortran rules apply. Okay, so the first directive is the parallel directive. And that's just a block of code that's going to be executed by multiple threads. So uh, here's here's our example. So pound pragma OMP parallel and then optional items here. Uh, then you've got these curly braces that denote the scope of the pragma. So the code within these two curly braces is going to be executed by multiple threads. And then anything outside of it will be executed by a single thread um, because that's when the threads have rejoined. Okay. Now, if you're a Fortran fan, here's what's happening for you. It's very similar. Um, so you've got your pragma and then uh, your parallel section, and then you have an, a corresponding OMP end parallel phrase at the end to denote the scope of the parallel section. All righty. Here is an example. This is my first OMP code. I'm of course, using something that I haven't explained to you yet, but this is OMP get thread num. We'll learn about it later. It's kind of like uh, MPI rank. It's the equivalent. So you're finding out which thread number am I. So I just have my main. I define this one variable. I begin my parallel region here. And in this region, I have this variable TID, which I've declared private. And I'll explain what that really means later. But basically, it just means each thread has its own personal copy of that variable. Um, and so I set it to be my rank effectively, like MPI rank, but OMP get thread num. Then I'm going to print out what my rank is. And then I'm going to print out I am sequential now. Now, if you're a, a Fortran fan, I've got the same thing for you. It does the exact same thing. So let's see what happens when we run it. Okay, so the first time I ran it, I got hello world from threads, zero, one, two, three, four. I am sequential now. Okay, the second time I ran it, I got hello world from, from threads, one, two, zero, four, three. I am sequential now. Okay, now, the order of execution of my threads is scheduled by the operating system. 
Okay. Now, most of the time, it'll turn out like we see on the left there, zero, one, two, three, four. But then one time out of a million, it'll turn out in some other order. That is something that can make things, make errors really insidious in OpenMP. If you're not expecting to depend on some ordering, but it turns out that you actually are, then, uh, then you can run into these problems, okay? So that is something to watch out for when you are programming with OpenMP. Okay, so our next directive is the loop directive. Remember, we were talking about the SMP architecture, really great for loops. So if we have a loop, we have all these, uh, you know, these things that we're doing in a loop, a shared, mem shared uh, memory is really great for loops, arrays, that kind of thing. So this is what uh, the pragma is. So we've got pound pragma OMP4, and then we have uh, just these curly braces to denote the extent of the for loop that we are parallelizing with OpenMP. Okay, then there's all these other optional items like the schedule, uh, the list of private variables and list of shared variables and no wait. And we'll talk about what some of these mean right now. Okay, if you're a big Fortran fan, you know, this is this is the same thing. So instead, you know, in in uh, in in C, we call it for. In Fortran, we call it do because that's what we call loops in those respective languages. Okay, so OMP do schedule and then OMP and do. And you have your loop in the middle there. Okay, so now um, you can schedule a particular type of a schedule. There's kind of four different types, a static, dynamic, guided, and runtime, which I'll tell you what those mean in a minute. Uh, if we have a no wait here, or in the case of uh, the C syntax, we have it at the very top here with the OMP4 pragma, uh, then that means the threads won't synchronize at the end of the loop. They'll just keep going. So we'll talk about the scheduling now. So how do we schedule the loops? In other words, <clears throat> how are they run? Uh, so the default for that is determined by the implementation. That is not specified by the standard, but there are kind of four main ways. So let me tell you after I get a little drink here. Okay, so static. Static scheduling means that uh, every time you run this loop with the same size of the loop and the same number of, of threads, that the ID of the thread that performs any particular iteration is the same, okay? It's a function of the iteration number and the number of threads. Um, static uh, scheduling is assigned at the beginning of the loop. Uh, so in other words, you go into the loop knowing exactly which threads are going to be executing which iterations. Uh, this is really good if you have kind of a known predictable amount of work per iteration. And there's a very low overhead to it because it's just pre-scheduled, kind of just based on the uh, number of the iteration and the number of threads, okay? All right, another choice is dynamic. And so in this, the, uh, the threads are assigned their work uh, at runtime in a round robin fashion. So each thread, gets more work after completing the current work that it has done, that it was assigned. Um, in this way, you can actually achieve good load balance if you have a variable amount of work per iteration. Um, it does in introduce extra overhead though, uh, because instead of just already knowing what work the thread has to do, it has to go back and find more work to do. Okay. So um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about uh, this, but basically the idea is if you, you can do static, um, static scheduling uh, is the simplest way and it has the lowest overhead. Now there's something called chunks where instead of just each individual 
uh, iteration is assigned out individually. You might have chunks of iterations. You might have like, um, you know, I don't know. You have a loop that has like a million um, iterations in it. Maybe you assign a hundred or a thousand to each thread at once. Okay. So um, that has, if you do static, that has the lowest overhead. Um, if you do dynamic, it does have a higher overhead. Um, there's guided, and that is kind of hard and also has a high overhead, but you can really optimize um, the, the running of the loop if you really understand it and can guide it about how, how precisely to do it. Uh, and then also, you can also have the choice of just runtime, which means you have an environment variable at runtime that you set that decides how the loop is going to be scheduled. A little cop out, but um, actually can be good for when you're trying to test and see what gives you the best performance. Okay, so we've talked about uh, loop iterations and parallelizing them, um, but what can we actually parallelize? So um, loops that are parallelizable have the following characteristics. So you know the number of iterations when you enter the loop, and the number of iterations does not change as the loop progresses. Okay, so that's one factor. Each iteration is independent of all of the others, and there's no data dependence between iterations. Okay. Um, Loops that are not parallelizable are conditional loops. That's one example. So that's a loop where, um, you know, a lot of times people will do this. They'll iterate through, they'll, they're trying to calculate something. They use an iterative method and they have like an error bound. And so they're like, well, when the error is less than 10 to the minus six, then I'm going to quit. Okay. Well, if, if that's how you decide when to end your loop, you don't know how many iterations upon entry into that loop, right? You can't predict that. Could be one, could be a thousand, could be a million, who knows? You could never quit. Um, so in that case, that is a conditional loop that is not parallelizable because you don't know the number of iterations upon entry. Okay, iterator loops like iterating over a standard list in, in C++, uh, that is also not parallelizable. Um, if you have iterations that are dependent upon each other, like uh, the, the fifth iteration depends on the result of the fourth iteration, then, then that, is, that is not parallelizable. And if you have data dependencies between iterations, that's also not parallelizable. I read this trick. I, I think it works. It seems like a good trick to me. If, if you can run the loop backwards and still get the same results, then it's pretty much almost guaranteed to be parallelizable. I'm sure there are exceptions. I've never seen any exceptions to that rule, but I thought it was a very useful rule. Okay, so we're gonna have a little example here. Um, so Gaussian elimination, is uh, a math thing that you probably did even when you were in high school, you just didn't know it was called Gaussian elimination. But the idea of Gaussian elimination is that you are solving a system of unknowns, um, a, a linear system of equations, okay? So um, you probably did it, you probably did something where it was like, you know, three X plus Y plus Z equals five. Uh, you know, 6x minus 3y minus 3z equals 5, uh, I think I already said 5, um, 7, and, and, then, uh, and then a third equation, right? Like x plus y plus z equals 0, okay? So you're trying to solve that for x, y, and z. Now, actually, my son was just doing this in, in algebra class last year. So I got great pleasure from explaining to him that this is Gaussian elimination. But what you typically do is you take like you take like one of the equations, 
and you eliminate all the x's from all of the other equations using that equation. Okay, then you have two equations in y and z. And then you take those equations and you take one of them and you eliminate the uh, the y in the in the third equation um, to have an equation that is only in z, right? And then you can solve for z easily, right? Once you solve for that, you back substitute it into the previous equation that had y and z in it, and you find y, and then you use your z and your y, and you back substitute them into the first equation, and you solve for x, okay? So that is Gaussian elimination, and that is what this is doing, okay? It's just that this A is a matrix that just represents the coefficients that we had in that, um, in that system of equations that I described to you. And then B is just the, the part on the other side of the equal sign, okay? And this is uh, an algorithm for Gaussian elimination, okay? This is a kind of a graphical example of how it works. So in Gaussian elimination, what we do is we take this yellow row here and we use it to eliminate this yellow column, right? We wanna make all of these into zeros. And the way we do that is by taking a multiple of this, of this and subtracting it from the next row. And then we take a multiple, a different multiple of this and subtract it from this row. Etc. till we get all the way down there. And that's what the I loop, the outer loop in this, this I loop is going through which row that we're using to eliminate the subsequent rows. Okay, and the JK loops are subtracting um, this from these rows and the K represents which column that we're subtracting uh, individual components from. So as we progress, so we got rid of this one. We got, these are all zeros now. So we got rid of it. Um, so we ignore these. Now we're on to this row and column. This is called the pivot row and column. So we're subtracting a multiple of this from the rest of these uh, and, and updating the entries in this green part. Okay, and we keep progressing like that until we get to the very end, okay? That's how Gaussian elimination works. So knowing that fact, then we, we can figure out uh, which of our loops, because you see we've got three loops here. It's very exciting, very great potential. We've got this loop, the I loop, the J loop, and the K loop. We've got those, uh, and we want to parallelize them if we can so that we can get the best performance out of our Gaussian elimination. Okay, so let's think about these. So our outermost loop is the I loop. So if you recall, the I loop has to do with, I'm taking this row and I'm subtracting it, or, or you know, a, a multiple of it from all of these other rows. I'm subtracting it from all of them. Okay, so that's what the I has to do with. So it has, there's N minus one iterations of it. If we have an N by N matrix, N minus one iterations. And our iterations actually depend on each other. So for example, I after I subtract this from everything here, then I subtract this second pivot row from everything here, right? And the values in this pivot row that I'm using to subtract from here are dependent upon whatever I did up here to subtract from this row before. So that means that uh, this outermost loop is unfortunately not parallelizable because the values from the previous step are being used in my current step. All right, well, let's think about this J loop. So it has um, N minus I iterations. If you look here, um, it is you know N minus I iterations which is constant when we enter upon entry here, we can calculate it and it won't change, right? So that's good. So that means it's potentially parallelizable. Um, but then 
the iterations can be performed in any order. So this is true. So the J, what the J is, is I'm taking this and I'm subtracting multiples of it from this row and this row and this row and this row and this row. And it doesn't matter if I subtract it from this row first or if I subtract it from this row first or this one, it doesn't matter what order that I do that in, right? I'm still getting the same answers because there's no dependency between any of these rows, okay? So that means that my J loop is parallelizable. So that's good news. So I could parallelize that, yay. Okay, now let's talk about my innermost loop. So my innermost loop also has N minus I iterations. We can see that here, uh, N minus I iterations. And what it is doing is it is figuring out, um, it is subtracting like uh, the multiple of this value from this value and the multiple of this value from this value. Uh, and so it doesn't really matter if I do that subtraction here first or if I do it over here first or if I do it anywhere within this row, it, does, it really doesn't matter uh, because they're not dependent upon each other and I'm gonna get the same answer. So that means that those iterations can also be performed in any order. So that's pretty cool. So that's a good sign. So I can, I can, uh, I can probably uh, parallelize either of these loops, the, the J loop or the K loop, but not the I loop, unfortunately. Yes. Okay, so here we go. I parallelized my code. You see what I did? I added one line. You see that? I added one line. And that parallelized this J loop. Okay, we can combine the parallel and the for into a single single pragma. So um, that's that's the beauty of OpenMP, right? I told you that it was very compact, right? Can you imagine if we were trying to parallelize this using MPI, right? It would be terrible. It would be impossible. You wouldn't be able to read it. But this. It's the exact same code with this one line. And this one line just says, I'm going to parallelize this J loop. That's all that line says. And so it's very understandable, very simple, very compact, very elegant, and beautiful. And that's really what I like uh, about OpenMP. It's just pretty amazing like that. OK, so I'm going to keep going on this. Uh, so. Uh, if there are any questions that I can answer, I'm happy to answer them. However, I suspect, oh, sorry, I said suspect. That's what my daughter always says. I suspect that um, Helen can probably answer them even better. <laughs> so, um, Ben, I so, really am asking many of the questions. Thanks again. Okay. And, and remind the <laughs> users that people, I uh, think if you asked, question in Zoom and if it's not answered, check the Google Doc. Yeah, we, we're putting these questions in the Google Doc answer in there. Yes, thank you. Okay, so, um, so another thing that we need to talk about now is synchronization. So sometimes you actually do need to make sure that threads execute regions of code in a consistent order. Uh, so maybe you have one part that depends on another part um, being completed. Maybe you have something where only one thread needs to really execute that. We don't need to have all of them doing it. Uh, and so there are some synchronization directives that we're gonna talk about here. Uh, critical, barrier, and single. Okay, so <clears throat> critical, this is our first one. So critical specifies there's a section of code that can be executed by only one thread at a time. We don't want any more than one thread in there executing it at a time. Um, and so you might have a critical region. So you do, you would use pragma OMP critical, and then you could name your region. Um, and if you had a big region, you would put the curly braces around it in the, in the C syntax, of course. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that names are global identifiers. So critical regions with the same name, including no name, are treated as the same region. So if if they both have, if you have two critical regions, they both have no name, then they're the same region. And then um, 
those parts, it's only going to allow one thread at a time in either of those parts. Okay, so that's critical. And next is single. So single means that the enclosed code must be executed by only one thread total. Uh, so this can be really useful if you're doing sort of thread unsafe things. Um, IO is always one of those sorts of things. And this is the, the syntax, so pragma OMP single. And again, you would use the curly braces to denote the scope of the sig single pragma. Okay, then the barrier. So this synchronizes all of your threads. So it's the same thing as MPI barrier when we, when we looked at that. So when your thread reaches the barrier, it waits until all of the other threads have reached the barrier and then they get back started up following the barrier. Um, and so here's your syntax for the barrier. Uh, now the sequence of work sharing and barrier regions that you encounter must be the same for every thread. So uh, they can do other stuff in between, but the sequences have to be the same in terms of the uh, work sharing and barrier regions. Okay, so now we've got another one, which is reduction. We, we already learned about MPI reduce, so this is very similar. So this reduces a list of variables into one using an operator. Same types of operators, max, sum, product, all those sorts of things. So the syntax is pragma OMP reduction and then the operator a colon and a list of what you're reducing. And the list can be, um, sorry, the list is a list of variables and the operation is one of the following operations. Okay, so before we get to variable scope, I just want to pause for a sec. Okay, so uh, Meng Yao asked a really good question. In the previous example, J loop and K loop are both parallelizable. Which loop should you parallelize, the outer one or the inner one? Okay, so something to keep in mind is that when you fork threads, then there is some overhead that you are you are going to have inevitably. So, strategically, the best thing to do is to minimize the number of times that you fork and join threads. So therefore, generally, you're gonna probably see better performance if, if you parallelize the outer loop, so the J loop instead of the K loop. Because um, with the J loop, you're only going to do it uh, N times. Uh, with the K loop, you're gonna do it like N squared over two times or something like that, okay? So that, that's why you would probably want to do it that way. Okay, then Kevin asks, for our application of finding pi, oh, you're thinking about this already, you would want to use single over critical for the adding calculating pi printing part so that only one thread does it. Okay, so for the printing part, yes, you could, you, you could use single or you could just, um, uh, you know, because you're going to print at the very end, so you could just close up shop and not not be in a parallel region at that point. That's probably the recommendation: is to just be out of the parallel region altogether. But if you were going going to print uh, within the parallel region, then yes, you would want to use single. Now, um, for the adding calculating pi part, uh, what we're going to actually want to use is that reduce, right? That's really what we're gonna use for that. Okay, so let's talk about variable scope. Um, so we're gonna learn what is variable scope. Uh, we're gonna have some scoping clauses and we're gonna talk about common mistakes. Okay, so variable scope, the basic concept is Variables can be shared or private within a parallel region. So when they're shared, 
that means that there's a single copy that is shared between all threads. It's in a common memory location. It's accessible by all of the threads. A, a private variable, on the other hand, each thread makes its own copy. And private variables exist only within the parallel region. OK, so by default, all your variables are going to be shared except the following. So the index value of a parallel region loop, that's going to be private. Uh, local variables and value parameters that are within subroutines called within a parallel region, those are also private. And variables that are declared within the lexical extent of the parallel region, those are also private. Um, I would say, in my experience, variable scope is the most common source of errors in OpenMP codes. So getting that correct is the key to uh, correctness and good performance in your code. OK, so you can explicitly scope variables, and that is what I recommend, OK? Uh, and, and explicitly list them when you're entering a parallel region. So uh, one, way, one, one clause is called shared. And so you have shared, and then you have a list of all of the variables that are shared, OK? Now, by default, all variables are actually shared unless otherwise specified. Uh, so remember, all threads are accessing this variable in the same location in the memory. And race conditions can occur if access is not carefully controlled, especially write or updating access. I mean, I guess everybody can read it. That's cool. But if, if um, variables are writing to it, um, you have to be really careful with shared, uh, with shared variables. OK, the next one is private. So private. So remember, it makes a copy for every thread. So a private variable exists only within the parallel region. And its value is undefined at the start and after the end of the parallel region. Now, you can instead use first private. And what that does is it starts, it initializes your private variable when it enters the parallel region to be the value that that variable held immediately before ent entering the parallel region, okay? Or you can use uh, last private, and what that does is it ends with a defined value. So at the end of the loop, we would set our variable to whatever value was set by the final iteration of the loop, okay? OK, so here's some common mistakes, very common mistakes. <laughs> um, if you make these mistakes, you wouldn't be the first or the last person to make them. So don't feel bad. Um, often people will make a variable that should be private, they make it public. Uh, and then something unexpectedly gets overwritten. So the solution to this problem really is you should explicitly declare all variable scope every time. Um, another common thing that you'll find is non-deterministic execution. You get different results from different executions. And again, a lot of times this is just because you have a variable that has the wrong scope. Another big one is a race condition. So sometimes you'll get the wrong answer uh, and you don't know why. So, so solutions for this is you want to look for any overwriting of a shared variable. So that's, I mean, that's, that just happens all the time. Uh, and if you can't find it, you can use a tool such as Cray Reveal or the Cody tool, which we also offer at NERSC, uh, to rescope your loop, make sure that the scoping is correct. Because those tools are pretty smart and they can kind of figure it out for you. I don't know how they do it, but they do a good job. OK, so let's look at my uh, new Gaussian elimination here. So we all, of course, understand what Gaussian elimination does. So um, I have defined, let's see, I've defined my, um, my loop variables here. 
double ratio. And then uh, I'm just going into my loop here. So remember, I just put that pragma OMP parallel four here. Um, but what's wrong here? What is there anything? Do you see any variables that I have here that are that are shared that should be private or anything like that? Let me see any problems. I think we've got some. Ah, okay. So everybody has, a lot of people have noticed that, yes, uh, the risk here is that I'm sharing J, K, and ratio, okay? And if I'm sharing those, they could overwrite each other and I could get really wrong answers. Um, okay, so in the case of J, I don't have to worry because J is the, um, is the loop uh, iterator for this parallel loop. So OpenMP will automatically make that private. But ratio here is shared and so is K, right? Because I didn't explicitly say that it was private. I didn't say that those were private variables. Uh, and so since I didn't say that, then they're shared. So that's exactly what's gonna happen. Um, so you can see what I'm complaining about here right now. Is, oh, I'm sorry, I went back. Um, so the K and ratio variables are shared variables by default. Uh, it's possible that if my compiler might optimize out K and then I'll be fine with K, um, but ratio is always gonna be shared. So the danger here, is, right, is that, the danger here is that um, with ratio, um, you know, let's say I'm a thread and you're a thread. So I overwrite ratio to be my ratio. And then uh, I'm, I'm fixing here to, to multiply here, but I don't get there yet. Uh, and before I can, you overwrite ratio with your ratio, right? So then I'm gonna be multiplying by your ratio and I'm gonna be getting the wrong answers here. Okay. Um, okay, question about J, where is J set to be private? Well, it's set to be private by the standard. So the standard it, it understands. Um, so the implementation here will say, okay, uh, pragma OMP parallel four. Okay, so I gotta look for a for loop. The first for loop that I come across here, that is the for loop that is that is uh, parallelized, okay? So it comes across this one, for J equals I. Uh, and it says, okay, well, that means that this J here, which is the index for this loop, that J is going to uh, be private by default because that's the rules. Okay, and then why isn't I shared? Okay, I is shared. I suppose I is shared. Uh, Helen, you can correct me if that's wrong. Uh, I is shared, but but fortunately, I never changes. So we don't have to worry about I in this I, case. I is not in the parallel region. Okay, I mean, it's right here. So what happens with this I? Is it just constant? And I is, is not changing, like you said. Yeah, <laughs> Inside okay. the parallel region. Right, so because it's not changing in the parallel region, then we're fine with I being shared. Although, uh, uh, I mean, if we were, Helen, if we were really wanting to do this properly, and we wanted to name all of the variables that should be private, I mean, should I be private? I mean, I don't know. All right. Uh, yeah, you can make it private or uh, something called thread private. <laughs> thread private, okay. All right, well, thank you. That was something I wasn't sure about. Okay, so that's um, an interesting fact. Okay, so here's what I can do. All right, so Helen, if I did this, <laughs> and I didn't include I in any of these, 
Is it going to complain because I've got default none? It's probably going to actually complain, huh? Default none, complain at I. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, okay. Well, all right. So this isn't completely correct. But what I did, though, was I made sure that J, K, and ratio, well, I didn't have to do J, actually, but I made sure that, well, I guess because I'm saying that I'm default none, then I had to include J here. So J, K, and ratio, those are private. And A, B, and N are shared. And I should have put I in there also as shared, I suppose. OK, well, interesting. So I didn't really fix the mistakes. I need to add, add the um, I in there. OK, so hopefully that makes some sense to people. And you can let me know if you have any questions. Yes, and by setting default none, then my compiler is going to catch any variables that are not explicitly scoped. So it'll catch I. <laughs> and I is shared uh, better than thread private here or because it's not changing. Mm -hmm. So I should put it under. And shared. Under shared. OK. OK, so anyway, the compiler would catch this and it would say, hey, Rebecca, you forgot about I. And then I would have to add I into shared. So I'll update that for next year. Yay. Okay, so let's talk uh, about- Do you also need a pair of parentheses around none? Uh, default parentheses none? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so, yeah. Maybe that's just a Fortran thing then. It could be, or it could be you could do it either way. I just don't know. Um, I don't think you can. I don't think you can list variables with the default clause, can you? I think it's just either default none or nothing. You can put default first private, default shared, default private. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, open MP oh, okay. right okay. now, so. Yeah. Okay, but but not specific variables. Not specific just, variables, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So let's, let's see. Is it more work if a variable is made private rather than shared? Um. So a variable that is made private, it's not that it's more work per se. It's just that it takes up more memory. I mean, there could be a little overhead, but a, a private variable. You know, it, there's just one copy for every thread. And yes, the OpenMP line can be split into multiple lines. Um, so that's what I did here with this backslash here. Then that um, means that this line, this next line here is part of this pragma line. Good question. Okay, so let's talk about runtime library routines and environment variables. Okay, so um, so there are some runtime library routines that we can use that, that come in handy at times when you're using OpenMP. So one of them is OMP set num threads, and that sets the number of threads that you're gonna use in the next parallel region. Now you have to call this from the serial portion of your code. Uh, then there's OMP get num threads. We already saw that before. It's, well, oh no, we saw get thread num, but get num threads is kind of like MPI size. It's the same, same idea. Uh, so it returns the number of threads currently in the team that's executing the parallel region right now where you're calling it from, okay? And then OMP get thread num, that is the rank of the thread. And like, um, just like MPI, we start counting at zero. So we go from zero to the number of threads for your thread number, your rank. Okay, now there's also environment variables that you can set before you run your code. So these environment variables can control the execution of your parallel code. So let's say, for example, you wanna set OMP schedule. So you can set it to be dynamic and chunk size four. Uh, and then there's another one called OMP num threads. 
and that sets the maximum number of threads. Um, and so you can set it to be you know, four. Again, it's a good number. I like four. Um, so you just do export like you would do for any environment variable, export OMP num threads equals four. And there are a few more that, that are useful to set um, that you can find, especially in our in the NERSC uh, job script generator. It has a lot of environment variables that you can use um, in order to run your jobs. So you can just search NERSC job script generator and you'll find the job script generator. And you'll see what I'm talking about, uh, about different uh, OMP variables there. Okay. So if we're going to use FNMP, um, you remember I said you could use the same code with, with OpenMP or without. Um, because your pragmas are just going to be ignored if, if, you're, if you disable OpenMP in the compilation. Uh, so what about the OpenMP runtime library routines, though? Huh? Yeah, Rebecca, we got you there. No, you didn't, because there's this macro called underscore OpenMP, and it is defined if OpenMP is available. So you can use this to conditionally include OMP.h, the header file that has all the OpenMP functions in it. Otherwise, you can redefine the runtime library routines if OMP.h is not included. So here's an example. So if underscore OpenMP is defined, then we're going to include OMP.h. Otherwise, in my code somewhere, I use OMP get thread num. Uh, and so I'm just going to define that long thing as a macro for the number zero. Okay. So then when I come down here, if I'm looking for my thread number, well, if I included OMP.h, then I'm using the actual OpenMP uh, function here. Otherwise, I'm just setting me equals zero. So that's that's the way that that you can do this. Uh, if you have any, if you're using any of these OpenMP functions, now if you're not, then you don't even need anything this clever. So now, mass. I mean, the majority. I think all at this point, standard compilers support OpenMP directives, and you can enable them using compiler flags. Um, so it, with the Intel compiler, it's minus Q OpenMP. With the GNU compiler, it's minus F OpenMP. Um, and with the PGI or NVIDIA compiler, it's minus MP. And with the Cray compiler, it's minus H OMP. So uh, yeah, you can just enable OpenMPs and, and just um, compile your code and be very happy. Okay, so um, oh wow, this is a good complicated question, and I will talk about it in a sec after I'm done with this section. Thank you for the question, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we want to set our OpenMP environment variables in our batch scripts. Uh, so. Mm. I think this was on a Cori uh, Haswell node instead of a Cori KNL node, but it is a similar idea. So we should use the job script generator, which I had already <clears throat> talked about, um, to, to figure out what specifically we should use on our KNL nodes here. But like I said, there's these, there's OMP num threads, which I already talked to you about. There's OMP places, OMP proc bind. I don't know that I completely understand those. I know that Helen completely understands them, but I do not. Um, so what I do is I go to the JavaScript generator and I make it uh, figure these things out for me. And then I just I just let it set those in my script. These settings are fine to use on Kano as well if there's no um, open, uh, yeah, this, this is actually MPI, um, MPI tasks for threads. So yeah. using C8 or a bigger C is fine here. Okay. It's, good. it's okay with Kano as well. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> good. Sure. Got the Helen seal of approval. So that means it's good. Okay. So our next um, assignment is to compute pi with OpenMP. Okay. Um, I think I would 
instead of doing that, I would like to address the question from Yaya Mirza. So the question is, can you please talk a bit about synchronization overhead from using OpenMP slash shared memory model and how that relates to the actual utilization of the CPUs slash supercomputer on real world applications? This problem is going to get worse as we get to future 100 plus cores in a CPU that will be here very shortly. Any thoughts on how to make this problem hurt less within the context of OpenMP? Wow, that is a great question. Um, I don't, I don't know how to best answer your question. Um, so I think, um, so yeah, so I think th that, um, I think some of what you're asking anyways is about, you know, the fact that I guess when they first started OpenMP, we had maybe a couple of threads per, per node. And now we're talking hundreds, hundreds of cores. Um, we could have hundreds of threads. Uh, and so like, how do we, how, how do we exploit that in, in order to, um, in, in order to take advantage of everything that the, that the processor has to offer. Um, and so I think that's an excellent question that I think there are, are, are a number of, of things that we need to think about with this. So um, so the, the first thing is, I think your application needs to be able to exploit that. And that is not the case for all applications. In fact, that is not the case for quite a few applications. So, um, so, so if you have an application that um, is very flops intensive, then I think you're, you're still gonna be able to use those 100 cores very effectively. If you have an application that's not so flops intensive, then yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's not the architecture's fault. It's just the, the way that, that your code works. So you would probably need to uh, try to expose more parallelism somehow, or possibly even change your algorithm. I mean, a lot of people have these algorithms that that uh, worked really great, but they just they're just not as suitable anymore for these type of architectures. Um, but then also, there's just some problems that you really can't, you know, you can't solve that way at all. So you you just have to do the best that you can. Now, when you are using successfully using these hundred OpenMP threads or something, um, uh, yeah. So then, there's definitely going to be some uh, overhead from uh, any kind of a shared memory model that you use, um, and so that is going to depend a lot on, um, I'd say, the operating system and developers of the operating system. And on um, uh, the the um, people who design the compilers and um, and stuff like that. Um, so I think a lot of those problems are kind of um, you know beyond the scope of what I know about or what I could help people with. Um, but definitely, if there are ways that they can change their algorithm to be able to exploit even more parallelism within the node, that is something that is my area of expertise that I could certainly help with. Um, okay, so then, yeah, okay, so then um, another thing that you can do, which is related to your second point, I think, which says one more point, if you try to make the problem hurt less by using locality aware idioms within the context of OpenMP, do you then pretty much end up emulating a message passing model within OpenMP? Thus, what's the point of using OpenMP for future processes? Uh, <laughs> these are very, uh, very philosophical questions, I would say. Um, so if you, I guess what I would say, my response here would be, um, you just kind of have to do what works. So a lot of people actually will not uh, run with like uh, one MPI process per node. They 
So um, because they don't get as good of a performance as if they run with like, let's say two MPI processes per node and half the number of open MP threads per MPI process. Um, so I think you just kind of have to um, just try to be practical and do the best that you can with what you have. Um, and, and yeah, there's always gonna be a lot of overhead that's, that's going to um, detract from your performance. Uh, but ultimately, I think the, the people who are, who are working on these machines with these big scientific applications, um, they're doing it so they can do some science, not so they can uh, you know, make, make their code perform perfectly. Okay, so in practice, how much utilization are you actually seeing in your applications? CPU plus supercomputer. Um, so different applications have uh, different levels of performance, um, but some of some of the applications that I've worked with in the past, I mean, they're lucky to have um, like 10% of the flops. Um, because because they're not actually using the machine for the flops for the for the compute power they're using it more for the memory um, for the amount of memory um, so for example you are trying to um, well you're doing nuclear physics right so you're you're calculating bigger and bigger nuclei there's not actually a lot of computation that happens there um, you're doing a, a Lanchos iteration which is I mean, it's somewhat computationally intensive, but it's not really that much. It's really more about storing all of the all of the entries, I guess, in the matrix that you're computing. Um, and because memory does, um, you know, over the course of years, memory has not grown as much as flops have grown in, in machines. I mean, you know, since 2009, we we now are a thousand times more powerful of a machine, right? But we're not a thousand times more memory on the machine. We're maybe 10 times more energy or somewhere between 10 and a hundred times, uh, did I say energy? I mean, memory, 10 times more memory. Um, and so they really need that memory. <laughs> they don't need the flaps, right? So they're getting worse and worse performance effectively for the same types of problems. Uh, yes, we could introduce the roofline model of performance analysis, but we also have some folks here who don't even understand <laughs> what I'm talking about right now, not to mention um, the roofline model. So, so we can leave that for another day, probably. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about OpenMP. Okay, so um, again, we don't have all that much time. We have... Uh, I guess we have about 35 minutes. Um, so let's talk about the original darts. Um, how could we use shared memory parallelism to compute pi? Um, so does anybody have any ideas about how we could do that? Yes. For the loop, we could use OpenMP. Okay, um, that's true. That's good. Um, yes, Kevin Wang, congratulations! You win the prize. A parallel for reduction. Yes. So, Radford, you had the same idea. You're just a little bit later than Kevin. Reduction for the sum. Right. So, Scott, that's what we're gonna do. Yes, we could just parallelize the four and then we could somehow add them all together. But instead, what we want to do is we want to use the reduction. So how does reduction avoid race conditions over the sum? The nice thing is we don't have to know that because that's OpenMP's job is to avoid race conditions over the sum. Um, I, I actually don't know how it works under the covers. Uh, maybe, Helen, do you know? How how reduction works to uh, prevent race conditions? I think it's a it's local implementation. Some all use like tree kind of algorithm reduce 
half and then half and, and does its <laughs> optimization, mm -hmm. but it'll definitely avoid the other ways um, internally. Yeah, okay, awesome. Okay, so that is correct. That is exactly what we're gonna do. We are going to um, use a parallel for reduction. Okay, um, so there's a few things we also need to think about here. So another thing that we wanna consider is, um, you remember that as they, as my, uh, as they call it in the Harry Potter movie, you remember they had that, that wretched car that they took to, to school one year. Um, so we have to do something about our wretched sort of random number generator. <laughs> Sorry if that's a, I'm a little slap happy here in the afternoon. Um, so we have to do something with our, our uh, yes, our wretched uh, pseudo random number generator um, because, um, you know, the um, random, random last, remember that variable, uh, that's going to be shared. Uh, and they're all going to want to share it and they're all going to overwrite it and chaos will ensue. Uh, in, in addition to just possibly duplications, but then also we'll have race conditions with, with that uh, shared variable. So we'd probably want to make that one private. And then um, we'd also want to initialize it, probably based on our OMP thread num, right? Kind of like we did with our MPI rank. All right. Okay, so um, we could do it together, or I think I think we might be better served to move on. So what I will do is I will instead I will show you it. I'll show you the answer. Let's see if my answer is yes. Okay, so. Here is how I did it one time. This doesn't mean that this is the best answer. It just means this is the answer that I did one time and put into this repo, okay? Uh, so I have my uh, parallel oh, loop. But are you sharing your uh, terminal? Oh, I am not sharing it because I. it is too late at night. I'm sorry. Wait. Um, I was so I was like, wow, I've got it, everybody. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you, Helen. This is what I did one time. It was not maybe it wasn't the best of all um, solutions, but this is how I did it that time. Uh, I think there are better solutions. Uh, but basically, this is my this is my um, loop, right? That I'm reducing over. Um, I'm reducing over the variable n circ because I want the sum of all of the uh, all of the dart throws that are that are thrown inside of the circle. Um, X and y, I said those are going to be private. X and y is you know my x y coordinates. And then uh, I made this a critical um, a, a critical region. Where only um, only uh, one uh, thread can do it at a time. So in fact, this really isn't a very good solution because it is kind of um, because this is a critical region. It is effectively serial, right? So uh, a better solution would probably be like I was talking about before, which would be to make random last be a private variable for each um, uh, for for each thread, make them each have their own copy of random last and and then have them also initialize their own copy of random last to a different number. okay? That makes sense. So I probably ought to do that <laughs> at some point and then update uh, this this repo because like I said, this is actually a pretty poor solution, but it is a solution. It does solve the problem. 
um, it's just not very parallel. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, good. So I'm just going to keep on going then to the next next old thing. We're going to talk about hybrid programming. So this is the the last part that we're going to learn about. Okay. So we're going to talk about, you know, like why you want to do this. Things to think about. Um, we're going to talk about the different levels of MPI threading support, how to design hybrid algorithms, and some examples. Okay. So look, we've got these multi-core architectures. Uh, they're not going anywhere. Um, like we talked about earlier today, at the at the macro scale, big big scale, we have a distributed memory machine, which is perfect for MPI. On the micro scale within a node, we have an SMP sort of an architecture, which is suitable for OpenMP. So why not both? Yes, I need that meme, you know, that girl, and, and she's like this cute little girl, and she's like, ¿Por qué no los dos? Right? Why not both? She's so cute. Oh, uh, that's what I need on this slide. So that's I'm going to add that next year. Okay. Why not both? And um, when we do both, that is a hybrid programming model. Okay. okay, so that's really exciting. But is hybrid programming always better? No, <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, especially if you if it's poorly programmed. Um, and so it really depends on the suitability of, of the architecture um, and your algorithm. So you can kind of think of it similarly to um, an accelerator model. So in the OMP parallel region, we're going to use the power of multi-cores. Uh, in the serial region, we're going to use only one processor. So if your code can exploit threaded parallelism a lot, which I put in square cut, square, I put it in scare quotes because the definition of a lot is probably different for different people. Uh, then try hybrid programming. If you think it, if you think it could be useful, then give it a shot. If not, no harm. Okay, so these are things to think about as you transform from um, an MPI only code to a hybrid code. So. No right answers or wrong answers to any of these questions. These are just sort of things that you would want to think about. So first of all, are communication and computation discrete phases of your algorithm, or can they or do they overlap? It's just something to think about. Doesn't, you know, one way or the other doesn't mean you should or should not do hybrid programming. It's just things to think about in order to optimize the, the hybridness of your program. Um, Communication between threads. How would you want to communicate between threads that are on different um, processors? Um, would you want to communicate only when you're not in the parallel region? That's probably the simplest thing. Would you want to have like a manager thread that's responsible for inter-process communications where it's going to communicate with other MPI processes? Uh, would you want to let some of your threads perform inter-process communication? Or would you just want to have like just wild west and let all of your threads communicate with any other threads or any other processes? So that would, how would you want to organize this? Just again, things to think about. There's not really a right answer. It's just kind of think about these things before you get started. So MPI has threading support. The MPI 2 standard defined um, these four threading support levels. So zero or MPI thread single, it means only one thread allowed. No uh, no threads and MPI, they don't mix. Uh, and what, what this means, it, it doesn't mean that you can't use MPI, or, I'm sorry, you can't use OpenMP within your code. It just means that you can't, you cannot, um, you cannot execute an MPI function within a threaded area, okay? So the next, the next level is MPI thread funneled. So the, the hmm, should say the manager thread, not the master thread. But anyway, the, there's only one thread and it is the only thread that is permitted to make MPI calls, okay? The next one is the MPI thread serialized. And that is that 
all threads can make MPI calls, but only one at a time can make an MPI call. And then the third level is MPI thread multiple, and you have no restrictions. Any thread can make any MPI call at any time. Uh, and then um, the, the MPI one standard, it just only allowed this MPI thread single. And that is call, MPI calls are not permitted inside of parallel regions. Okay, so if you wanna know what threading model does my machine support? So you could, you could run this program. Um, and so it's just, instead of, you'll notice here, instead of MPI init, we have MPI init thread. Okay, and then RC and RV, and then we have this MPI thread multiple, and then we have this variable called provided, which is gonna return, this is something that we supplied, it's gonna return the level of support. Okay, so then we print this out. Supports level blah provided, level provided of MPI thread single, MPI thread funneled, MPI thread serialized, MPI thread multiple. So it's gonna tell you, so it's gonna be like a number of zero, one, two, three. And so then, then you'll know which one it supports. Okay, so I ran this on Corey. I ran it on the Haswell node, but it's the same everywhere. Uh, and so I ran it and it supports level two, level two. So if we go back here, level two is MPI thread serialized. So all threads can make MPI calls, but only one at a time. Now, uh, that is the default setting on Corey. Uh, there is actually an environment variable where you can get level three. However, it's not recommended. It's experimental. Okay, so explaining, I, I showed you there was that MPI init thread instead of just MPI init. And so you put in what you want and what is supported is what you get back. So we've got required and supported. Now, this is a little strange, but the level of thread support that's provided by the implementation, uh, if, you, if you're wanting some level, but it's not available, then it's gonna give you the lowest level that's greater than what you wanted. And failing that, it's gonna give you the, the highest level less than what you required. So in other words, if you, if you required level one, and for some strange reason, it didn't, didn't supply level one, then it would tell you uh, that it's two. Uh, and then if for some reason it didn't supply one or two or three, then it would tell you zero, okay? And if you just use plain old MPI init, then that's equivalent to just asking for MPI thread single for level zero. Okay, now when you do this, uh, when you call MPI init thread, then you need to call MPI finalize using the same thread that called MPI init thread, okay? I, I guess some people must call MPI init thread within a threaded region, but I would not do that. I would, I would start up my MPI, and then I would start up my OpenMP region, and then I would close my OpenMP region, and I would close my MPI. That's how I would do it. Otherwise, you're just going to get yourself spun into a huge web of confusion, I think. Okay, so then there's some related useful MPI functions. So uh, when you're in something and uh, you want to know, I'm in a thread, is this thread the main thread or not? So that's that like main master manager thread. If, if it is, then, uh, then it's going to return true or false. Uh, and then this is also, this is the same as that um, um, level. If you want to know what level of thread support that, that it is being provided right this moment, then MPI query thread will tell you the answer to that. Okay, so let's say we just have single, the single threading model. So. Again, I just want to remind you all, single is this lowest one. 
where there's only one thread allowed to do anything um, MPI related, okay? So um, we wanna use the single pragma when we wanna use our MPI function within a parallel region, okay? So the way we would do this is we would have a barrier and all of our threads would get to that barrier. Then one thread, single thread, would go in here and do our MPI function. And then it would come out. Meanwhile, everyone else has made it to this barrier. And then we would proceed. Okay. Um, funneled. So our M MPI implementations that we have on Cori support funnel. Um, so in this case, we would have OMP barrier, we would have the master. Hate that word, but I'm afraid that is the word in, in OpenMP, isn't it, Helen? Um, anyway, then we would have our MPI function and it would be only executed by one thread in that way. Okay, now we can do serialized. Serialized is also supported. Um, so, Serialized, so single just means only one of them can enter this in a, at a time, right? But everyone can do it. So this would be a way that everyone would do it. And we don't need to have a barrier afterwards. Okay, now multiple. The Intel MPI implementation, so we do have the Intel MPI on machine. I didn't include it uh, in, in my uh, other slides before. Uh, and it does support multiple. Uh, so does the Cray MPI, you can turn it on with special environment variables, but the performance is suboptimal. You don't need any pragmas to connect to protect your MPI calls. You can just do them whenever you want to. Okay, so there are some, some caveats here that make things challenging for you. So the ordering of the MPI calls is maintained within each thread, but not across MPI processes. So this means that you are responsible for preventing any race conditions that may occur. Okay, <laughs> so good luck with that. Um, and blocking MPI calls, like we talked about MPI receive, that blocks only the thread that called it. So MPI receive is going to block from that thread that, that called MPI receive, but all the other threads can just keep on going. Okay, and then I would just want you to know that we rarely actually ever require uh, the, the multiple thread model. Uh, most algorithms we can write without that model at all, okay? I, I've never really seen anyone use MPI thread multiple very successfully. Um, it, it is really hard and, and it's really hard to, to, um, uh, to implement uh, an, an MPI implementation that would actually work with with thread multiple, uh, not to mention then writing something on top of it. So I, I would, my advice would be, let's avoid that whenever we can. <laughs> okay, so which threading model should I use? Okay, my answer is a resounding, it depends. Okay, so it depends on your application. Now, if you use the single model, it, you know, a good thing about that is it's portable, like every MPI implementation supports single. It's very portable, it's very straightforward. Uh, but it, it, there's some limitation to the flexibility. Um, another option is the funnel. Uh, it's so fairly simple to program. Uh, the, the thing you run the risk of is that your manager thread, if it's doing a lot of MPI calls, it could get overloaded with those calls. Serial, uh, you have more freedom to communicate. Um, uh, but you have like a risk of too much cross communication. Um, that's just that's my perspective anyway. Um, why why have every thread communicate when you could just have one bigger message that goes out? It could be more efficient. Uh, and then multiple. I mean, it, it's allegedly thread safe. Um, although I did just tell you that you're dependent. Your your it's your job to solve any race conditions, so it's not completely thread safe, I suppose. Um, but it's really limited availability and it's really suboptimal performance. I, I really don't 
I don't see a reason to use multiple if you can avoid it. I mean, there may be some strange, unique algorithm that requires multiple, but I've never seen it. All right, so then um, at risk of sounding like your mother, uh, just because you can communicate thread to thread, it doesn't really mean that you should. So like I was saying, uh, there's a trade-off between lumping messages together and sending individual messages. I mean, so if you lump messages together, then you have one big message with a single overhead to it. So it's probably more efficient. Uh, but if you send individual messages, maybe there would be less wait time because they, you know, they would all be able to be sent off instead of waiting to accumulate enough to make a big message. Um, but another thing to really, really think about is the programmability of whatever you're doing. So, I mean, your performance is gonna be great when you finally get it working. I don't know about y'all. I, when I was a grad student, I was writing a code, you know, for my dissertation. And I was like, oh, well, there's just one more error. Once I fix that error, then there won't be any more errors. Of course, my code will work perfect after that. Uh, of course, that was never true. There was always yet another one, yet another one. So um, that that can be the problem when you're when you're trying to do something fancy. It can be hard to just even get it to work, even though when it does work, it'll be really amazing. But uh, you you know that's a big big if about when it will actually work. So that's kind of my my advice is to try to keep it as simple as you can rather than just doing something really complex and, and that may not be actually worth the effort once you get into it. Okay, so let's talk about an example of, of a mesh partitioning. So again, this is not, um, this is, I'm not gonna show you an actual code. This is just a concept. So we have a regular mesh of finite elements. Okay, this is a very common type of a problem that that people solve on a supercomputer. So uh, finite elements, it just means pieces, basically. I mean, you don't have to worry about what finite elements actually are. But what we do is we take a, a domain, an area, and we partition it. We divide it up into little pieces. And uh, we solve for something like the potential energy or the, um, you know, anything like that. So when we partition up the mesh, we're gonna to need to communicate between the different pieces of it. So we're gonna to have to communicate information about cells in, in our mesh that are adjacent within the domain to their computationally remote neighbors. So then, um, so here's something that we might do. So we have, let's say we have four processes, okay? Um, and then we might, use uh, four threads for each process. So this is process zero, this is thread zero. So you can see they have, um, you know, that each of them is solving something on their domain, right? Now, now when I wanna solve something in this element, I need to figure out, I need to find the, the results of this element so in order to inform the results of this element. So there's gonna be communication across these dark lines. Okay, so this is kind of basically like what the communication is, it, it kind of looks like, right? So like, it, so depending on how I wanna do my communication, I could either just send these big purple lines and the, and the width of them, you know, kind of represents like how much data I'm having to send. Or I could send, um, you know, these green ones. And and by the way, when this, this line is like going specifically from this thread to, to this thread, it's not going to do that exactly, but it is going to go from this process to this process, and it's going to be initiated by this thread. So um, on one hand, I could send just one big message, or I could send multiple little messages to uh, to each of these different um, threads. Um, and so it just kind of depends on how you want to execute it, and you know the speed of your network and the efficiency of sending. Um, things and and also the, your algorithm, whether you can send a big bulk message or whether you really want to send things off asynchronously. So 
that's kind of the example of, of I'm just trying to kind of illustrate the concept of the differences in how you could program that. Okay, so last but not least, we could write the code for programming Pi with hybrid programming. So this is like putting it all together. So combining our internode and intranode parallelism to create a hybrid program that computes Pi using the method of darts. So basically we would wanna take our uh, darts OMP and our darts collective and combine them into darts hybrid. So thinking about this, um, how can we combine these two to create a hybrid program that computes Pi? Are there any pitfalls that you see? Now everybody thinks it's gonna be great, right? It's gonna be super easy. Okay, well, let me show you my answer, which again, is not a good answer <laughs> because uh, I based it off of my OpenMP answer, which wasn't very good either. But here are some things that I've done. So I initialized uh, MPI, MPI init thread, and I wanted to have uh, MPI thread multiple. I don't know why I wanted that, but I did. Okay. Um, Um, so I set random last to be my rank um, in, in order to initialize it in a different location. Um, and then I just copied my own pay parallel loop here. Okay. Now, um, like I said, this isn't actually a good, uh, good implementation. And so I'll definitely fix it for next time. But um, what I would want to do is instead of set my random last to be the rank, I would want to set my random last to be some kind of a combination, a unique combination of the rank and the number of threads, right? That's really what I would want to do. Um, so I would want to do that within my um, private or my parallel region, sorry, within my parallel region, I would want to reset random last to be something like that and then I would want to do the production and when I, instead of doing this I would want to um, make this uh, random last be a private variable as well and then I wouldn't need this um, critical section okay then I use MPI reduce to reduce the these um, answers that I got from every um, every MPI rank, I would reduce it using MPI reduce. And then if I'm the manager, then I calculate pi. Okay. So I hope that makes some sense to you all. I'm sorry we didn't really get to do them all. It'd be nice if we had a little more time. But uh, we do not. Um, so there's some really great resources. So this is the book I was telling you about that our very own Helen wrote, along with two colleagues. It's a really good book. I have a copy. Um, um, anyway, then there's a lot of other good resources. And uh, these are just some of the things that I learned, learned from a lot of these about how to uh, how to um how to use OpenMP? I guess I should go back to slideshow mode. Um, anyway, <laughs> some of these are really cute names, like how to parallelize your code with ease and inefficiency. <laughs> uh, and then if you need a little light reading, we've got the OpenMP standard, and you can see some code examples uh, from the OpenMP.org website.
And then hybrid programming, there's a lot of um, really interesting resources out there about hybrid programming. And then um, anyway, I uh, my background is numerical methods. And so I told you, don't actually use this method to compute pi. So if you really wanna know about how to compute pi, I have this in these appendices. So you can look it up. You can use the BBP formula uh, and your programming language probably has a pi constant actually. And then random number generation. Um, there's, uh, I told you before, there's no such thing as a random number generator. It's really called a pseudo random number generator. And it just generates a long sequence of numbers that appears random. Um, so the one that we used is uh, a linear congruential generator. And it has a short period, I mean, because it's only 714,025. Uh, that's the period. It's not actually uniformly distributed. It's known to have correlations, but it is reproducible. It is quick and easy to compute. Uh, so don't actually use it for anything except for these exercises. There was a famous linear congruential generator called RANDU. It was used for years and years in our um, nuclear stockpile simulations at, at uh, labs like Los Alamos and stuff. Um, and this is a picture of RANDU. Um, so you can see these correlations in, uh, yeah. So what this should be, this should be like a cloud of number, like a cloud of dots, but you can see these planes of the dots. <laughs> so it uh, was not the best um, linear, kind of, well, it was not the best due to random number generator and linear congruential generators are actually usually pretty poor, but Randu was unusually poor. So if you want an actual good random number generator, uh, the Mersenne Twister is the best one out there from what I understand. The GNU Scientific Library uh, has many generators available, including the Mersenne Twister and also MKL also does. And then there is a, a, a pseudo random number generated library called Spring for parallel number generation. Um, and so I recommend that as well. And that is all I have for you all today. Uh, I really appreciate you coming along. And if you have any last questions, I am happy to take them. Oh, the parentheses are needed for default. Oh, well, thank you, William. I'm glad, glad you pointed that out to us. Okay, I will fix that. It's not like explicitly specified in the spec specification, but um, practically each compiler will complain about it. <laughs> oh, well, okay then. Uh, yeah, I never saw it in the specification. Okay. Wow. I guess we both learned something today about that. Cool. Okay, any other questions or anything? I think we have answered all the questions. Okay, good. <laughs> well, I really appreciate everybody who stuck with us. I know it was pretty long and probably your brains are in pain and hurting a lot, but I appreciate it. And if you have any more questions, I guess um, you can look through there and there may be answers to your questions already. Um, if not, you can feel free to send me an email if you have a good question that you think I can answer. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you all. And I'll see you all next time.